It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therat's here. Actually, he's in Mexico City. Richard Campbell's in New Zealand. But you're here, and I'm glad you are because it's time to talk about the Windows Insider program. It ain't what it used to be. Is it Windows 12? You're getting your first taste if you are a Windows Insider. Edge brings along something it calls Video Super Resolution. Then we'll talk about AI. Maybe it's time to resurrect Cortana. All that and a lot more coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therat and Richard Campbell. Episode 819, recorded March 8th, 2023. 64 threads, but none for you. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures that if a device isn't secure, it can't access your apps. It's zero trust for Okta. Visit collide.com slash WW and book a demo today. And by Lenovo, orchestrated by the experts at CDW to help transform your organization with Lenovo ThinkPads, equipped with the Intel Evo platform for effortless connectivity and collaboration from anywhere. Learn more at cdw.com slash Lenovo client. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we talk about the latest news from Microsoft. And we are truly an international program today. I'm coming to you from the United States of America. Uh, joining mm -hmm. us from the hot zone of Mexico City, <laughs> Mr. Sure. Paul Therat, Roman Norte. Hello, Paul. Hello, Leo. It's, uh, what's, the, what's the weather like today? Leo, the temperature here never changes. It's, it's well, actually, it's, it's, this is the hottest time of the year. So it's plus or minus five degrees from 70 degrees and then plus or minus five degrees from 50 degrees. That's so. perfect. It's yeah. like, that's perfection. Every So a million years ago, I was at a Microsoft show in LA and I stepped outside of a restaurant with a friend from Microsoft and I said, what's the temperature? And he says, I have no idea. I said, well, whatever this is. It's perfect. It's perfect. It was probably and 72. This is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is what it is every day. Here. Or as they call it in New Zealand, 20. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us from New Zealand, from Taranga, yeah, in, on, on the South Island, at his family farm. North Island. North Island. Mr. Yeah. Richard Campbell. Is the North Island, so the North Island is the rural area, and the South Island is where Auckland and, 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 and all of that is. No, is that, other way around. Other way around. Yeah, yeah, North, Island, right, yeah. yeah North Island is somewhat um, Hawaii-ish, a little more oh. jungly, a little hotter. Oh, nice. And you have the big cities there. It's even shaped like Hawaii. Is, it's sort of the big island style. Yeah, and South Island is uh, mountains down the west side, uh, sheep farms on the east side. Nice. And that's where Queenstown is. That's where uh, that's where all the billionaires are coming from the United States when the yeah, all the drone shots in the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And when we did the last show, I was in Auckland waiting to fly to Queenstown to do right. a wedding, and then since then I've hopped over to Melbourne, Australia, for a reception, and then what? came back. Good Lord, to the farm of the North. Jeez. Good Lord, you are a tra so. How you did know, the wedding go? How did the wedding go? The wedding was great. Nice. Yeah. And it was it was not a view of Mount Doom. It was a view of Iraqi, which is actually the mountain that stood in for the Lonely Mountain. Ah, the Lonely Mountain, uh, the, the Misty Muhammad. Mountains. Yeah. So, yeah, because right. um, Jason Snell from MacBreak Weekly just got back. And he well, yeah, visited actually, the, all the of Lonely that. Mountain is from the Hobbit, and it is nowhere near the Misty Mountain. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> so I have sorry. to explain this to you. I'm so sorry. I, 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 nobody knows geography anymore. I, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> It's not real. It's, I can, it's a book. I confuse. I confuse all the all the cannons. I am confused by all of them at once. I am such a loser. Anyway, <laughs> what is, is happening in yeah. Windows? So I thought Microsoft. I thought the whole thing about Windows 12 was just yeah. a, a chimera, a, a no. mirage on the horizon. But apparently, I'm wrong. Well, let's. So let's. Before we get. So there was a major change to the Windows Insider program uh, this past week. Before we get that, I, there, I, I just want to step back for one second and think again about what just happened last week, right? Which was they released this thing that they call internally a moment update, moment two. We don't, that's not the public name. In fact, the public name is ludicrous. It's like a KB article number, basically. But this is part of Microsoft, what Microsoft calls continuous innovation, right? Um, we're only going to issue one feature update, capital F, capital U, which is beautiful, <laughs> um, every year. 
And we're going to update it, though, from time to time in between, right, with new features. Okay, small f, small u, I guess. So the Windows Insider program at some point last year uh, switched from each channel being tied to a specific Windows version to most of them not being tied to a specific Windows version. It wasn't until we got down to the release preview channel that that thing mapped to either what was out now or is out coming out soon. Um, and so the addition of these small feature updates has thrown a little bit of a, I think might explain what they're doing, right? Like the, we don't just have, we don't have a next version of Windows to think about. We have a next set of features to think about. And that's basically what they're testing in the Windows Insider program. It's part of the confusion about these changes. Because, I, I, you know, historically, we've always thought about Windows as versions. You know, there's typically a version, some you know, version will come out with Windows 10. It was twice a year. Um, with Windows 11 now, it's once a year. But we have this other thing or these other things, right? We don't know how many moments there'll be this year, but obviously somewhere between two and whatever, number four or five, whatever. We'll see. So that's the first big thing. Um, just to kind of put that, just to, to level set this next conversation because Microsoft just announced that they're adding a new channel to the Windows Insider program because I think when anyone looked at the Windows Insider program and thought, what's wrong with this thing? Everyone said not enough channels, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> Which is such a weird thing. Um, in the notes, I, I, I copy pasted something that Raphael gave me. Uh, this it's where it says, here's a cheat sheet um, because this is not how Microsoft announced it, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but th there's some changes here, right? So the, the release preview channel hasn't really changed. These are still features that are going to ship imminently in the next release. Um, the beta channel previously was not tied to a release of Windows. Um, this one actually is targeting the next release of Windows, even though Microsoft does not say this. All right, this is according to sources that Raphael has at Microsoft. Uh, the dev channel, which also did not target a specific release of Windows has not changed. Actually, this this part of this is the one part that hasn't changed at all. It's the same as it was before. So these little far out features may or may not make it into any version of Windows. They're testing them now. And if, if everything goes correctly, and let's be clear, nothing ever goes correctly, things would st new features would start in dev, work their way through the channels, hit beta. If a feature ends up in beta, it is a bigger chance it's going to end up in the next version or some version of Windows. If it ends up in release preview, it's pretty much going to happen in the next version of Windows. Like that's a that's a very logical approach. Um, that's not what Microsoft has done, honestly, for much of the features that it has released through this cha these channels. But that's the theory, anyway. Um, what they've added is a Canary channel, right? Which is a familiar name if you test web browsers like Chrome and Edge and so forth. Um, Microsoft did not say this. But my understanding now, based on multiple sources telling me this, is that the Canary channel is where they're testing Windows 12. Um, it doesn't mean literally Windows 12, but these features are so far out that they will almost certainly arrive in Windows 12. And uh, as we get further into the show, what you'll discover is that uh, new features will appear in Dev and Canary at the same time sometimes. So that might indicate, who knows what that indicates? I mean, it might indicate they're coming to Windows 11, but of course they'll move forward to Windows 12. Of course they will. Um, you know, they need to keep the next thing up to date with the current thing, like that makes sense. So the things we're gonna be looking at are the features that go to Canary and then kind of stay in Canary, <laughs> at least this year, you know, at least until the next version of Windows 11 is released. Um, and I think it's those uh, different, you know, those unique features that might indicate things that. Windows 12, you know, so we'll see. I mean, the but, presumption of calling it Canary is going to break. Yes. Right? Oh, and, and they were, the actually, they were explicit about that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, so Microsoft. Guess, I mean, you, you're in your notes, you mentioned like kernel changes, which is an interesting thing to think of. Like, what are right. they going to do there? Yep. Yeah. So they, uh, in, in the announcement post, said, um, like, this thing could break. It could be so bad you might have to reinstall Windows. Um, they were talking about little or no documentation. You know, normally with these releases, they'll issue a blog post. Um, Isn't that normal, ironically. though? I mean, don't they always say that? Yeah, yeah well, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I uh, they just released a new build, uh, the first ever Canary build today, 
And of course, there was a blog post. <laughs> so they're already off on a great start there. But, um, you know. <laughs> you know, I think we said we definitely wouldn't do. Yeah. We yeah, did. It, it, it's, you just said you weren't going to do this. But anyway. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know what to I don't know what to think about this. I, I like I said up front, I, I don't think most people would have thought, you know, we need another channel. If you sort of think of it as in terms of Windows 12. OK, I mean, I guess so, you know. At least, you know, as a tester today, going into that thing, what it is, and if you don't, if that's not what you want, um, you know, stay out of it, right? I mean, that's easy enough. Um, obviously, uh, the hope is that anyone uh, enrolling PCs in the Windows Insider channels are um, technical enough to know how to do a clean install of Windows if they have to, and they can get out of this stuff. I mean, obviously, there's still that lingering problem with Windows and ARM, but that's a very small audience today. And I can't imagine this year goes by without public ISOs happening. So um, I almost something. wonder if it's a mistake, if they just like had some problem with deployment and that page hasn't lit up yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> That's I actually, a, so that, that, It gives you some confidence in their abilities. <laughs> I actually, you know what? Th well, okay, we're going to get to this because we're going to talk about AI but later. But I will say Microsoft, like any other company, if you're, you're an up-and-comer, you are career advancing, whatever, you want to go to the parts of the company that give you the biggest headroom to do that kind of stuff. You want to have new projects approved, you know, release new things. You know, you, you want to be on the, the leading edge. I mean, that's not where what Windows is, right? Uh, Windows is not the career advancement part of Microsoft. So, yeah, did somebody forget to flip a switch and uh, make the w Windows and ARM ISO? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> that's very plausible. Um, and I don't mean that cynically. It's, a, it's somewhat of a different team, and they may not actually know the workflow right. to right. go onto that particular set I of webinars. I bet Donna Sakar right. would. I bet she'd know what button to push. Donna knows sure. everything. Well, she would know exactly who to talk to, for sure, yeah. to make that happen. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, I, yeah, I don't know. I th This year is going to be very interesting for Windows. Um, it's going to be very interesting just in tech in general because of all the AI stuff we've been beating to death. But... But with regards to Windows and the Windows Insider program, I, it is very clear, and I I think Richard has heard this too. I've heard from many people. You know, speaking of Donna Sarkar, she used to uh, talk about how many uh, millions of people were in it, and it was getting close to I, I want to say twenty million at one point. It was seventeen or something like that. Holy cow! Um, it is, it is well. It's very clear that the Insider program today is a shadow of its former self. You think it's smaller? I mean that, yeah, from sheer numbers, and more important from an engagement perspective, yeah. because. One of the things that's been kind of beaten out of these people is the notion that they're going to contribute in any meaningful way. And I think it's tough. They, they've changed the terms of what they signed up to do. You know, when you signed into the beta channel in the past or the dev channel, you were testing something very specific. Now you're not. I think that turned some people off. They started doing all that A-B testing. I think that turned people off because they were there, again, for a specific reason. And they clearly, they meaning Microsoft, um, value telemetry data much more over actual feedback. Um, there, is too, there are far too many instances of feedback hub items just being totally ignored. And uh, a new release of Windows comes out and so something breaks, like the Kindle thing crashing Windows or, or whatever. And then, oh, look, someone reported this to the feedback, uh, feedback hub seven months ago. Um, it, it's, it, it's deflating, I think, for people who, you know, who want to be engaged. Like, yeah. who want to These are your biggest fans. These are... Your biggest Microsoft, fans. yes, the Windows yes. fans, yeah, yeah. Not exactly. your big, yeah. no, they're not Paul no, Ferrat's no, right, biggest right, no, fans. <laughs> well, they could, they're, 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 they're they're they could be both, but they're Microsoft's they're, they're, biggest fans. But, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Right. And those but are the, the, the insider program got out of control, right? Like yeah. they just let so many people in. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be a while to rehabilitate it. The ones that stuck around, the ones that are genuinely contributing, like they are valuable. They just right. have to be reminded and sort of get back in that loop. One and of that the being things said. On a, as a whole, third-party influence inside of Microsoft has not had a good few years. Yeah, right. One of the things we've talked about, though, in the past is that Microsoft, some years ago, decimated its ba its uh, bug testing team, mm -hmm. right? Uh, presumably, at that time, hoping that the Windows Insider program would, would uh, obviate the need for them. And then if the you decimate the Windows yeah, the Insider program, what do you got? They already the, they the have a problem with bugs industry. with shipping bugs, right? Telemetry will be Steven Snofsky's greatest influence, longtime influence over Windows. That that started in totally no? agree. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying no. I was like, this was this was his thing, and um, yeah. he was he loved to pull out numbers. You know, he'd stand in a room and say, "How many people in this room do this thing?" And he'd say, "Well, only the X." You know, I think you told the story about this, like uh, yeah, the IE nine story, right? It's like, yeah. hey, we're getting ready to ship IE nine. How much work are we going to do on yep. bookmark? 
Yeah, how many people here and, run and, uh, Windows Media Center? Everybody same thing. Marks and nobody else does. Yep. The problem now, with that, though, is yep. <laughs> I was just okay, going to say, exactly you, you say no, no, go ahead. I, the problem with that is that there's no context, and uh, you can make data. Data can, it just shows you one thing. You know that um, uh, I would say in our world, in the world of communities and enthusiasm and so forth, um, you need to pay attention to people who are influencers, and I don't mean that in the Instagram sense. I mean the people that people in their family or friends turn to when they need help technically are going to influence the decisions that normal people, mainstream users, make. And you're kind of cutting them out of the loop. And I think that's a, that's a dangerous thing. I think the over-reliance on telemetry data is potentially one of the biggest problems with Windows since, say, the you know, Windows 8, let's, let's call it. I, you know, it's in that time frame. Um, but, the, yeah, the other big uh, bucket of uh, data that can influence Windows is definitely feedback through the Insider program or just the feedback hub in general, right, because any user can send feedback in that way. Um, you know, Microsoft talks a lot about AI. You're telling me you can't use AI to filter out the most important bits of feedback, see which ones are the most important, see which ones go back the furthest, see which ones are still problems, uh, see how hard it is to fix or not fix those things. Um, it's, it's bizarre to be that they're not doing a better job with that stuff. Um, and it's, it's too bad. And, I, and it's just, uh, telemetry is just, it's, it's not enough. So I don't yeah. know if the change yeah. I don't think telemetry is bad on its own. It's that you've got to use it with other things. That's right. That's right. You know, telemetry is important. I mean, that, it's absolutely important. Um, but, you know, it, this uh, mad belief that numbers alone will tell us the story is, is what's going to lead AI down dark paths. I mean, this is, it's the same problem, really. It's like, you know, um, I, I don't know. Anyway, so that, that's my, that's my little editorial on that. But the, I, I don't know that adding a channel is going to drive engagement. Unless people believe it is Windows 12, I could see, you know, there'll be a little bump there. And, and if anything exciting happens there, we'll see. But um, I feel, I just feel like this program has been listless for such a long time. Uh, and it's too bad. And there's also, there's, there's a communication issue. And I don't just mean quality of communication, which, you know, is classic. But I also just mean uh, the method of communication. Um, you'll go to them sometimes and complain, hey, you, you know, people don't know this thing is happening. They'll say, what are you talking about? We tweeted it, <laughs> you know. Or they'll go back and edit a blog post that went out a month ago with some little bit of information, not understanding that you did the feed didn't get updated. You, you just, you, you blasted this information out to no one. Um, there's, a, there's a real problem there um, with the interaction bit, which I, is, you know, the, the very point of feedback from people is that you're interacting, right? Um, I yeah. just, I feel bad, you know, I, I have my own channels, obviously, but because uh, people, I'll, I'll complain about things and a very, a very <laughs> typical response from someone will say, well, did you put it in the feedback hub? No, I threw it in the toilet. What's the difference? They're not paying attention <laughs> to the feedback hub. I, you know, what, like I, I could probably reach Microsoft easier by just writing about it on my site than by putting something in the feedback hub. Doesn't mean they're going to act on it, by the way. I'm, they ignore me as easily as they ignore the feedback hub. But, um, but, but this, I, like, they don't have to answer everything in there. But surely there's a data collection facility that could weed out the important bits from the non-important bits. This is my, my basic yeah. take on that. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with you there. It depends on the team, you know, the, yeah. you can very clearly see like over on the .NET side that the teams actually use right. the issues from GitHub and the feedback hub and so forth as part of, you can watch their scrums where they talk through them all. Yep. yep. Um, they, the company certainly from the leadership has gotten a lot of pressure on, you know, don't act on your own, act on customer feedback. Right. And so, but you know, you get to then choose what do we consider customer feedback? And the great thing about using that telemetry is that you get to interpret it your own way. So <laughs> exactly. you can pretty, pretty much go on the mission you want, yeah, just yeah, where yeah. you slice and dice the telemetry data in the way that gets you to what you want to do. I, I don't have any particular insight into this, but I, based on what I see publicly, I feel like the Microsoft 365 team broadly, by which I basically mean the office part of Microsoft 365, mm -hmm. right? The, if you go to the Microsoft 365 blog and they put out monthly updates about all the new features that were added or here's everything we did to Teams or whatever it might be. Um, it's very clear a lot of that is feedback driven. Now, those products are so vast and complicated and diverse that 
you see a, a new feature in Word only appear in one version of Word and not in the other five or whatever, you know, because we have web, Windows, Mac, mobile, et cetera. Um, you know, that kind of, that's a problem. But they do seem to do a better job of uh, reacting to feedback. And it might mm -hmm. just be because those tend to be business customers, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think from the perspective of a typical business or enterprise customer that there's a lot of feedback for Windows. Just leave it alone <laughs> is probably the feedback. Yeah, for the most uh, part. I mean, that's, it seemed right. true for quite a while that the main thing we wanted from Windows was reliability, not features. That's not where we go to look for features. Right. Yeah. So maybe that and that and maybe I've just actually come uh, stumbled upon the real issue with the insider program, which is that most of those people are just individuals or enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. And uh, who cares? <laughs> you know, um, I mean, at the end of the day, that's not where that's not where the money's coming from. Right. Uh, to Microsoft. As the sun comes up on a beautiful Thursday say, morning in Taronga, New Zealand. Has the um, is the resurrection happening? What's going on? It's, it's <laughs> Richard, like, you're getting quite a bit of lens flare <laughs> from your right. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I've never seen light like that outside of like a, a religious <laughs> diorama. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm so, ascending. So I don't know if you have a, you could put a flag on your uh, a little flag yeah, on your camera. Yeah. You know, just a little thing. That, so funny. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah, it's he's slowly been getting like I know it's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. Been, <laughs> it's like, yeah, the heavens are opening. It's just so great. Uh, a couple of thoughts from um, the Discord. Uh, Jarno yeah. says. Well, Teku says uh, I don't use the Insider's build anymore. When you're testing something that was going to be releasing that was worthwhile but now it's just here to have some broken you know yeah. pieces right? right and uh and jarno g says on the other hand hardly barely any insiders are still complaining in the feedback hub so that means windows must be almost perfect now <laughs> and then uh well you chicken know what, says we, we, please we, stop we, calling me shirley so all together yeah. i think <laughs> <laughs> nice so yeah i mean i i yeah i i when you're ignored you stop talking right i mean yeah. it's, it's i, I yeah. think you're seeing that um I, I look i we're in a weird place because microsoft is trying to do some ui changes which i think are nice and and but they break things which i think is bad and then they fix things over time sometimes it takes a year they're fixing some stuff now that you know it, we're coming up on two years and uh do we celebrate that do we just sort of accept it in resignation um i don't know I don't know. We'll talk about one of those features. So does it actually say it Windows 12 on it anywhere? Or no, 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 no. Yeah. No. No. Because, you know, and Windows 12 is Windows 11, like Windows 11 is Windows 10. And it's just what the change will be the addition of whatever feature set, huh. you know. Yeah, it always comes down to, like, why do we need a new version number again? Like, what are we getting? Used to be. That was a big change, change, right? I mean, going from oh, yeah. Windows 7 to 8. Or... bigger than 11. I'm not sure why I have to explain this. I mean, it, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I think with my you know with Windows 10 there was this notion of we're going to sit on this one for a while, and uh, and I think they saw how that went. And then of course over time it's like you don't have anything for PC makers to sell. Yeah, you don't have any. You know, if the system works, it's boring. You know, if Windows as a service works, you're updating this thing with major releases twice a year or one major, one minor, whatever the cadence is, and uh, no, nothing breaks. Um, major in the context of Windows 10 with features is not anything particularly exciting, right? So, uh, I mean, what do you have at the end of eight years? You know, it's like, well, it's it still looks like Windows 10. It's like, what do we, you know, uh, I, 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 I've I mean, always... We have this problem in Office, too. Like, why would yeah. you make another version of Office right. when you're getting continuous update? All I know for sure is that stuff in Outlook keeps moving around and I can't Oh, my God. I, so, I, I flagged two things in Word lately that are major pain points for me. And the big one is in the, for the, for the, well, for the past 30 years, if you wanted to search for something in word control F, a little dialogue box came up and then you could click around and it would highlight each instance of the thing you were searching for. It was wonderful. If you do it today in word, a gigantic search pane comes up on the right side of the application covers one third of the text on the right side of it and is a horrific interface for finding stuff because often the word that's highlighted that you search for is under the search pane. It is the most right. horrific UI imaginable. And I listen, I, I get it. They have to update things, I suppose. But at some point... It's not like you were going to say the old word search was good. It was fine. I never thought about it. it yeah. <laughs> you know, it worked... You, you like, had no expectations. No, it was fine. 
Um, I don't know what they're thinking with this thing. I, I'm sure there's a reason. There always is, you know. I mean, but, I, I think everybody complains about search, every kind of search that Microsoft ever does. And so anybody yeah. who, you know, sure. has, has this moment where they're like, you know what I haven't touched lately? A third rail. Well, I he, could fix search. Like the third rail, yeah. <laughs> right. It's the, is the stove hot? I don't know. Check it. Um, yeah. You can't <laughs> be sure search. until you That'll do. go well. Yeah. Here's a sentence I never thought I would utter. Hey, word team. Why don't you look at Notepad and see how they do it? Because it's right. I mean, it is right. The the search experience in Windows, or the find experience, I guess we yeah, call it, fine. in, in yeah. Notepad works great. You know? Yeah, it uh, searches for the words that I type in in my yeah. document. And it's a good UI. It gets out of the way. It's nice, yeah. you know? And if uh, you're really fancy, you can use replace. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Anyway, so I... I don't have a big rant per se about this new scheme other you know, other than the comment I made up front. I, I don't know that anyone wanted this thing, but if it's a Windows 12, that makes it kind of interesting and it sounds like that's what it is. If I think there's any motion in the Insider program at all to me, sounds like good news because it's been stale and stagnant yeah, for quite yeah, a while. Yeah. Right. So if they've decided they need to make a new category and they're going to push some new bits up, right? I'm excited. I'm going to drag out that old hardware and, and fire up the Canary version and watch it die. <laughs> Yes. And by the way, I mean, uh, we have this kind of understanding that re where AI is really going to hit in Windows is with Windows 12. Presumably, yeah. some of that stuff will appear in the Canary uh, channel, yeah, uh, which, which, by the way, sorry, I, sorry to sort of sidetrack this conversation, but I've just reminded myself of something. Um, when Microsoft announced uh, Bing AI, or they, well, they don't call it that, but Bing chat integration in the Windows 11 taskbar, as they put it, um, the, the entire world, including Laurent, who writes for my site and, and all the other tech blogs, kind of just wrote it that way. Like Microsoft integrates Bing AI into the Windows 11 taskbar. Now, when you use this product, you realize that's that's not what happens. Um, it, there, there were a bunch of Bing icons in the taskbar in the start menu, like in, in uh, search uh, highlights, but there's no integration in Windows, really. It launches a web browser, which, by the way, is another sidetrack, sorry. I said last week that it was uh, it mistakenly using your own web browser. That's because I use Brave. So Brave actually undercuts um, search oh, highlights. And it does that on purpose. It's like doing that yeah, actively. And, oh, but don't worry, folks. Like I said, they would fix it. Microsoft found out probably because I talked about it, and now they, <laughs> Thanks. Now they work around Thanks, it again. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I know, I know. Well done. Yep, that's me. Anyway, um, so I had people come to me and say, how come everyone, including your site, is parroting this Microsoft marketing nonsense about being AI being integrated into Windows? And the reason is Microsoft told us about this release ahead of time, but didn't give anyone the code. Uh, so that even though we were all kind of testing stuff, this stuff didn't appear until that day later. So we all sort of took Microsoft's info, relayed it to the world. And now there's this collective body of work telling the world that Microsoft has integrated Bing AI into the taskbar. That's well, not what happened. But we didn't, we didn't know any better. You know, we just had what they told us to go on. They included a screenshot of a UI of Bing whatever that looked like it came from Windows. It didn't. It came from the web. <laughs> and we just didn't know any better. So anyway, that's how that happened. Just in case anyone is wondering if we were colluding with the software giant, we were just... Uh, don't shoot the messenger, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. We now know what happened. Yeah. I don't I, I don't like to call it Bing chat either because you don't want to chat with it. You want to work. <laughs> but there, well, okay. Yeah. But uh, notice that, at least I notice, that there mm. is a distinction between using ch uh, chat yes. BGPT and search and actually, you know, talking right. with yep. uh, Bing chat. And that's off on the right-hand side. Yeah. So. They're really, it is two different functions, right? I'm not getting... It, well, it's almost like they don't know quite how to integrate it yet. Uh -huh. I, I, you have to think... And by the way, so we're going to get to this. So there are competitors to Bing that are... Uh, well, not direct competitors, I should say. There are other products and services that are starting to integrate AI into their own things, like uh, Brave Search, we'll talk about as an example, or uh, DuckDuckGo is doing this as well, where they have presented this in a different way and it's a way that is more akin to what google was doing pre-ai which was you ask it a question and it puts the answer at the top and then it gives you all the search results right which i think is kind of a logical way to handle this it, there's a good chance this thing at the top will answer your question and then you can move on with your life and if it didn't you go down to the search results however ai not particularly reliable right mm -hmm. uh, these things it has hallucinations 
um, as they call it, which is a beautiful word. Um, Again, and, anthropomorphizing a piece of software. Yep, right? and you get the wrong answer and you think it's right and you move on because of course this thing is authoritative, it's on the internet, it's Google or Microsoft or you know whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, we'll get, to, we'll get to that. But that's a, I, I think the presentation of this information is gonna be the thing that changes the most. Um, well, I sh that and the accuracy, hopefully, right? I mean, uh, the capability. But yeah, how how they integrate this into how this becomes search, I guess is the way I'd put it, is up for debate. Yeah, and you actually, you know, fundamentally these chat phrases are being turned into search strings. So the yeah. search engine still matters. Oh yeah. In fact, when you ask Bing questions and it doesn't have a way to converse with you about it, it says, "Here are some search results." Mm -hmm. And it falls back on that, you know. Uh, so depending on what you ask it, that's true of all. Of it. It's not just Bing. I mean, that they all do yeah. that, but. Um, and it, I, I mean, it's fine, right? I mean, that's, you're at the search engine, you get search results. If, if that's the worst case scenario, you know, I mean, that's fine. Have you noticed they'd ever tried to use voice in any of this? Because we, I read into this with the Google home devices where when right. you'd, you'd give it a command and it didn't understand it, then it would return search results and it would read them out. Oh, Which is a great way yes, to let you know, I didn't do what you I, wanted me to do. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I, the, my, the two big things there for me that are interesting is I have an Apple watch and if I, if I'm leaning on something and the watch is kind of into my hand, it will mm -hmm. listen. <laughs> that's the, that's telling Siri to listen. So I'll be having right. a conversation with someone and then it will say, Paul, I'm sorry, but I don't know the, you know, and oh, it's I like, hate that know, so much. <laughs> it just I, so that's drives me thing. nuts. That's, that's one thing. Um, we're getting ahead of ourselves here a little bit because there's an AI thing coming up. But but the other thing is this notion of um, uh, search assistants, and I would say especially and maybe only Google Assistant doing this thing where you actually start do start a conversation. And it, this must have come out of the early work that they did for this AI thing, which mm -hmm. is you ask it a question, and then you, it, you it answers, and then for a moment it will pause to see if you want to keep going, and you can ask it a follow up question, and you don't have to hey Google it, you don't have to reframe the question, you, you just, it actually feels like a conversation because you're, you're still on the same page. I think that's a very early, I think that was Google kind of letting slip a little bit of the stuff we now see with the AI things, right? I mean, that was the start of that, I would imagine. Well, what's going to be interesting, I mean, Google still hasn't launched its uh, BARD uh, AI yeah. and search. It's going to be really, I mean, uh, I don't know if you saw the, was it a Verge or a New York Times story today that said, it was I like a, that you confuse those two, but <laughs> I don't. But I just can't remember. Uh, I do yeah. know that it was. I think it was a time story that said no, no. that, that uh, you know not only was it an all hands on deck event yeah. at Google when uh, when Chat. Oh, GPT uh, came this was out. in the Wall Street Journal. Journal. That's where it was. Yes. Yep. But that Google's yep. treating it as they did with Google Plus as yes. uh, a, a company wide mandate to get and the. Uh, that's AI what I wanted everything. to talk about with that. So, Richard, I'm dying for your take on this. So that's amazing that you just reminded me of that. So. Hmm. It seems to me that my that the current um, situation at Microsoft is that the word has gone out. You must AI all the things, right? This we don't want to hear about new features unless you can, you know, make it sound like it's AI based. This right. reminds me very much. Of course, I've been going through my book and I just ran through the the initial .NET period where Bill Gates was in charge of this thing basically and said, "Look, yeah. you're going to put AI. You're, I'm sorry, you're going to put .NET in everything." We're going to rebrand everything as whatever it is, .NET, you know, Windows.NET, Office.NET. Um, none of that happened. I mean, and there, it's there are other... Happened. Okay, yes. But, I mean, well, none of them, I mean, the major... But before stuff. that, it was ActiveX, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and lately, it's been Azure. That's right. Yeah, so do you see that parallel? I mean, do, when you look at Microsoft and AI, and of course, it's early. We don't see a lot of it out in the world yet. Mm -hmm. But when you think about things that will come to Windows or Microsoft 365 or whatever it might be, isn't this, it's that kind of a, an it's industry, that kind right? of behavior, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not bad to compare it to .NET for no other reason than like 23 years later, .NET's doing well. Yeah. But I, I think Microsoft has repeatedly come up with a brand that seems to have some PR traction and then just logs the snot out of it. Right. So Yeah, it's almost and, like they, they're so bad at branding when they, finally, when they finally land something, they get a little too excited about it. Yeah. But I'm also hoping that these a these large learning language models are coming from a common source. So um, today, Microsoft did release two builds of Windows 11 to the Insider Preview program, including the first Canary Channel build. Right now, contrary to what they said earlier, they actually did document it. 
is nothing dramatic, right? So if you're looking for kind of fun uh, Windows 12 type stuff, no. Uh, but the three things that stand out are uh, access keys in the right-click menus, you get an Explorer, meaning on the desktop or in the file Explorer windows. And what access keys are, are the shortcut keys. So you bring up that menu, and then you can type a letter to go to a particular um, item in the menu. So one of the goofy things about Windows 11 is that in a bid to simplify everything, they simplified that menu dramatically. If you compare what happens when you right click on the, you know, the task bar, sorry, not the task bar. Well, yeah, the task bar, the desktop or the recycle bin or whatever the item is, you'll see that the typical menu in Windows 11 is much smaller than the typical menu was in Windows 10. Well, how do you arrive at that? Well, one way is to remove items you don't really think you need, goofy. The other one is, and this is the bad one, unfortunately, they made some of the key items in those menus icons instead of, uh, vertical list items in text. So there's a kind of a horizontal row at the top or bottom, depending on where you click, of common items that you would access from right click. Cut, copy, paste, share, delete. You know, it depends on what you're selecting, right? So the problem with that approach, of course, is that these hieroglyphics aren't aren't commonly known to everybody. So you might, you're, you're like, I'm trying to copy something to the clipboard. What, what What's the icon? It's two little rounded rectangles over each other. It doesn't look like anything. That's what copy means. So uh, with access keys, is that the right term? Yeah, access keys. Uh, in the old days, you'd, you would access this by uh, hitting, like, I think the alt key. But now there's a menu key on the keyboards of most computers. And that will bring up little um, uh, little previews of what the letters are for each one. So... Uh, T for cut, C for copy, S for share, you know, D for delete, et cetera. So um, that feature is won't be coming in Windows 12. We're going to get it sooner than that because it's also in the dev channel. But um, the, the uh, Canary build and the dev build that came out today both have that feature. Um, there's also something called file recommendations in File Explorer. So if you're using the default home view, uh, which is sort of like quick access, favorites, recents, uh, things like that, um, they've added a, a, a new area in there called recommended. And these are files that um, you were working on with people in your organization. So they're only, uh, this thing is only something that will appear if you're signing into Windows with an AAD account, not a Microsoft account. So this is kind of a corporate thing. And the idea here is you're working on projects with other people. These are files that are part of that project. Um, if that sounds familiar, that's because they announced this was coming. So this too is not something that waits for Windows 12. This is something that will be in Windows 11 probably pretty soon, probably in moment three. Um, they're also testing this one in the dev channel. So nothing dramatic there. Um, the only one that I saw that was truly unique to, oops, <laughs> I set my microphone off the side of the table there. Um, that is the only one that's unique to the Canary channel is something called LSA protection enablement. This is a security feature called local security authority that helps uh, protect uh, against credential, uh, log on credential theft, et cetera. Um, it's, if you're familiar with Windows security, it's a new core isolation feature. Um, I don't think this is going to wait for Windows 12 either, honestly. I bet this one does appear downstream as, we, as the year goes on, but you know, that's about it. So there's nothing there yet, I would say, uh, but if people are excited to test what will probably be Windows 12. Oh, good, you're back. <laughs> Sorry, there's that. Welcome back. Um, and then the dev channel. It's like he never left. Got, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh -oh, some of those we don't have your things. audio, Richard. Oh, no. No. Oh, yeah, you're good. You're good. That was just uh, some, <laughs> some weird glitch. You're good. Um, they've just added more um, languages to live captions. So live captions is that thing in Windows 11 that will caption anything. So any audio source, whether it's like a YouTube video or maybe you're having a live meeting, whatever, it can caption, live caption anything. Um, this is in the dev channel, so it's still not out and stable. But um, Chinese, uh, simplified Chinese and traditional, uh, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Portuguese for Brazil, Spanish, and non-U.S. English dialects have been added. So... That is advancing. And I think that's, I mean, there's, there's other stuff, but I think those those three or four features across the two um, channels are kind of the big ones. So not super exciting, but that's where we're at. It's Windows evolving, right? Still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and I, I, yeah, we can, we can debate this until we're blue in the face whether Windows needs this evolving, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. whether this serves the user base in any meaningful way. I, I, I like it. You know, I... I Spending culture, certainly. But yeah. I mean, if you talk about hard things you would try and fix at Windows, 
which is yeah. to really, it would be like uncoupling the network stack. Right. And who's going to do that work now? Yeah. Right. I mean, what, what's the, what would be the benefit of that? I just don't. Well, the benefit would be that, that oh, the I, Oaks sorry. could reboot a network stack without rebooting a machine. Sure. Right. I, sorry. I didn't mean literally what the, I meant, yeah. <laughs> I meant, I mean, I meant the, whether, what was the, would, when does the difficulty of implementing this change override the, yeah, you know, <laughs> just, just don't do it. You know? hey, wait, are you going to make it more like a Linux kernel? Is that what you're doing? Like, I, when, when I run Linux, I don't remember what phase of Windows 12, or sorry, Windows XP development this was, but beta two or beta three, we did a little tour at the Microsoft campus. We met the guy who ran networking and they were just adding the notion of secondary networking profiles. So mm -hmm. you could have one for home, one for work. And I said, I said, this is fascinating. I mean, why not just do arbitrary networking profiles? And the guy said, no, it's impossible. And of course, um, <laughs> Windows Server 2003 added that feature. Impossible. Right. Can't do it. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. No, he was, yeah, he was like a, a Russian crazy guy, but he, um, a genius, you know. Anyway, they, they obviously figured that one out. So He's possible now. He can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Paul Thoreau told us. The way you said, it, the way he said it was so classic. It was no. like it was the stupidest thing anyone no. ever asked. it's impossible. So you made, I mean, you made two. Couldn't you make three? Impossible. <laughs> like, no. No. It's not I impossible. Thought that was so beautiful. Yeah. Let's take a little uh, break. <laughs> sure. And uh, do a little ad. Since when was this? We got them, uh, and yeah. then uh, we come come back and talk more about uh, other stuff. You've kind of gone through the uh, AI thing. Well, the Windows Insider bit. Yeah, but I well, see yeah, we did, a, we, did, we did a lot of the AI we, stuff. But we can go back a, to the actually, AI. I'd like to talk about the it. biggest chunk of the AI thing we haven't done, and this is okay. This is to me the most interesting part. Yeah, I, I think I know where you're going, and I, I think it's the most yeah. interesting part too. Um, but before we do that, my friends. <laughs> Let me tell you about Collide. Collide. We talked about Collide uh, before in the past. It's a really cool solution for IT departments that want to put end users first. It's a device trust solution. Many of us, you know, now are saying, well, you know, zero trust. That's the only way to do it, right? But do you really have a zero trust architecture if... People can log in and then use insecure devices or apps in your inside your network. I mean, I don't know if you do. Uh, and that's what Collide solves. If you're an Okta user, Collide can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. Collide patches some of the major holes in Zero Trust. That's that device compliance hole. And all you have to do is ask the major password company that recently had a major breach. And we've now learned the way that happened was they had a DevOps guy working on a laptop at home. He had an unpatched version of Plex on his computer, logs in to the company network. It, uh, you know, the bad guys use that unpatched version of Plex to put a key logger on his system. Then when he logs in, all of a sudden they've got the credentials. They've got, they've even got the, the uh, 2FA information there it's it's over don't let that happen to you your identity provider in theory only uh, lets known devices log into apps but you know we could see there's an extra step here just because a device is known doesn't mean it's secure right in fact plenty of the devices in your fleet uh like that devops laptop should not be trusted lots of reasons out-of-date os uh insecure apps you know personal apps on there maybe they've got unencrypted credentials lying around you know what they shouldn't have the problem is they don't so what happens is when you're using okta if a device isn't compliant or even if it's not running the collide agent you put the collide agent on all the devices right uh, it just can't access your company's SaaS apps or any other resources it just you know it's the device can't log into your your company's cloud apps until they fix the problem on their end so uh, let's say you're, uh, you've, you've got a DevOps guy at home. He's, he hasn't updated his browser, right? He's got the old version of Brave or something. Using end-user remediation helps drive your fleet to 100% compliance because what happens, they get a message, he gets a message, she gets a message saying, your browser's out of date, here's how to fix it. If they fix it, and now you're, you're at 100% compliance without... Involving or even, you know, overwhelming your IT team. They're not even, they don't even have to be involved. They could set, of course, you set the, uh, you set the requirements, but then it, 
the end user fixes stuff. Without Collide, IT teams really don't have any way to solve these compliance issues or, or stop insecure devices from logging in. But they, using Collide, you can set and enforce compliance across your entire fleet. No Plex, <laughs> for instance. And here's the cool thing. It's Mac, Windows, and Linux. It's completely cross-platform. Collide's unique in, it makes, in that it makes device compliance part of the authentication process. That's where it's tied in with Okta, right? When a user logs in with Okta, Collide then alerts the user to compliance issues, prevents those unsecured devices from logging in, and gets the user to fix it. It's security you can feel good about because Collide provides transparency and respect for users, puts them right at the center of their product. And users love it. Because it's, you know, it's just a simple, lightweight agent, doesn't bog them down, helps them do the right thing. Don't you think that DevOps person would have loved to have been alerted, hey, that Plex is out of date, you should fix it before we're going to let you log in? Don't you think that would have been a good thing? It would have been a good thing. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and, of course, most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Uh, this is such a great idea. Visit collide.com slash WW to learn more or to book a demo. We thank Collide very much for their support over these uh, past couple of years. But we also thank you for your support because when you go to that address, you're letting them know you saw it on Windows Weekly. K-O-L-I-D-E, collide.com slash dub dub. Dub dub. Make sure you use that WW. Now back to New Zealand and Mexico City <laughs> with Paul Therott. <laughs> and Richard Campbell, our international travelers all around the world. There was some late breaking news, Leo. Uh-oh. It's not super, super big, but it's cool. Yeah. Um, this was rumored, or we had heard leaked or leaked or something, we heard about this, but Microsoft just announced they're bringing something called Video Super Resolution to Microsoft Edge. It's available now in the Canary channel there, <laughs> um, and will make its way to stable over time. But basically what it does is it takes a low-resolution video, YouTube, whatever, and appears to upscale it. Wow. Or using machine language because you got to get that little AI hook in now, <laughs> obviously. Machine learning. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. I So when I yeah, downloaded yeah. Edge for Mac, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. boy, just, it hurts me just to say that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, just, but, <laughs> it hurt me to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> the top of the page says get the beta version. They kind of, they're kind of encouraging you for some reason yeah, yeah, to get yeah. the beta version. I did that. Well, maybe it's just not as far along on the Mac. I don't know. I don't know. They, you can scroll down and get the, you know, the sta standard version, but it's below the fold. They really, they, they, there's a big button at the top that says get the beta version. You like taking chances. You're a Mac user. I, well, um, I figured, <laughs> um, and it's been stable. It's been fine. The only, you know, the reason I downloaded it is so I can use uh, Bing chat, you know. Sure. But, um which works fine on the Mac. And it's actually a fine which browser. Is the, which is the PR win right there, Leo. Oh, yeah. Like, like, that, yeah. Oh, that's always oh, been yeah. obvious. That's why they put the little yeah. Bing logo in the search pill. It's always yeah. been obvious, right? We want you to use Edge. Life is like, better Like, where's Waldo? Edge. Like, how many Bing logos can you find in Windows? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's yeah. like those car channels that how, how, and all the logos for the car all hidden away in different spots of the car. Yeah, Look, exactly. it's, it's, it's in the center console. It's on the bottom of your seat. <laughs> Thanks to Kevin WW for uh, posting that in our uh, our Discord. Have you ever wished you could watch your favorite videos? It's like an right, AT&T commercial. Ever well, no, wished you could watch this, right? your favorite videos in high it's def? It's a, a, you know, a VHS rip on right. YouTube that looks like garbage. It's 240p. We actually whatever. know that this upscaling is pretty good because it is on a variety of TVs. Uh, yeah. I have it on my NVIDIA Shield, which has a really interesting AI-based upscaler. And it actually right. works fairly well. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why good. not? I think about this all the time. I, I, I'm not going to switch the edge for this, but hopefully they'll uh, throw it into Chromium and I can get it on Brave someday. That'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you brave users, you. I swear to God. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's tough when you're right all the time. So, <laughs> anyway, um, I keep saying every week, I think we're done with quarterly earnings. We're not. Uh, Dell chimed in recently as well. Um, and, and it was like beautiful other, for them. They had a great that? time. They, they were good. They made a fortune. They're so uh, rich. They did. We're they so had a great calendar year, and they had a really bad fourth quarter. Does that it's sound like familiar? everybody? Else. <laughs> Let me guess. Yeah. Wait a minute. Twenty-seven percent drop in sales on PCs. 
Actually, you know what? It wasn't too bad. The their client server solutions group, which is the PC business, their revenue. Oh wait, yeah, yeah sorry, you're right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it, it, annual revenues were down five percent. Uh, uh, quarterly revenues were down seventeen percent. So, well, that's still you um, know consumer PC revenues were down forty percent. Oh, uh, there you go. That's the number. Quarter. There's the number yeah. in a quarter. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's down. Is that down year over year? So like this quarter yes. was 40% down uh, over right. last yeah. year's Which, quarter. I mean, and this right. is the conversation we've been having all along. It's like last year was a bumper year. Right. Yep. As, as yep. the supply chain started filling in again and people caught up on orders. And so sure. comparing it is bad. Well, but uh, we have to. I mean, you know, it's... I, they I'd rather look at it against 2019. Just okay. Get, yeah, they didn't make... Of. I guess I'm too lazy to have made that comparison. I didn't do it, but uh, neither did Dell. Um <laughs> I, I think the uh, the thing I'm looking for here, though, and we've seen it with uh, Lenovo and HP, is some kind of a prediction for the future. Like, we think things are going to do pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't quite get there. Uh, they're going to focus on the profitable seg segments of the PC market, um, which, you know, gaming, uh, premium PCs, that kind of thing. Um, and they said, you know, 2021 historic, the PC market slowed markedly in June last year and experienced a sharp decline in calendar. Q4. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. duh. Uh, so they didn't really offer anything about a time frame. You know, Lenovo and Dell both sort of, oh, sorry, Lenovo and HP both sort of said, hey, by the end of this calendar year, we think we're going to see things even out a little bit. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We shall see. All right. This is the, to me, is the big story. This is the big, this is the big one. Um, and I'll, I'll just preface this by saying anyone who's watched an Apple uh, product announcement will be familiar with this notion of marketing, where you have to walk this fine line between saying this new thing is awesome because that last thing was a piece of crap, right? <laughs> the, the only way you can have double digit anything over the thing that you sold before is that there's something had to have been wrong with the other one, you know? So you have to kind of walk, you have to walk that line. Like we want people to upgrade. We want people to buy this thing. That's part of the marketing. Obviously you can also compare your product to competitors, but you know, Apple's kind of famous for this. 17X, 20X, 30X, 40X, whatever improvement in whatever the thing is. Um, we just had a conversation briefly about this notion that um, AI or uh, personal digital assistants were sort of the predecessor to what we're seeing today in AI. In fact, one might wonder why these AI front ends weren't going there first, right? The natural place to have a conversation about anything is with the technology that's there to have a conversation with you, right? Using natural user interfaces like speaking, right? Uh, instead of typing into a search box, um, but they're not. And um, uh, who was it that did this article? I think it was uh, the Financial Times, basically was talking about the decline of these digital assistants, which interestingly was an article um, I was starting to write a few weeks ago called A Diminished Voice. But the idea here is that uh, there were so many of these things, Cortana, Google Assistant, Siri, uh, Bixby, which I always think of as the name of the guy that turns into the Hulk, but whatever. There's a bunch of these things. And now, in order to push AI, these companies all have to distance themselves from the failures of these products. Most of them are still in the market. I mean, Cortana basically is the biggest failure of the bunch in the sense that Microsoft kind of gave up on it and isn't really pushing it as a brand or a product or whatever uh, in most places. But they got a quote from Satya Nadella who said they, meaning personal digits, digital assistants, were all dumb as a rock. <laughs> Whether it's Cortana or, or Google Assistant or Siri. Still anthropomorphizing. They do not work. Yeah, but um, that's he, kind of a cool opportunity. I mean, wouldn't you like a chatty little device in your house that goes on you know, and on and on? Of course. It gives well, you fake facts. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you like that? But Okay, but if you, but like, yeah, like I said earlier, though, you're in your house, you get your little, uh, Echo device or whatever, and maybe you're an older person and you're lonely, or maybe you know you're me and you know your wife's gone and you're by yourself and you you know you want to start interacting for whatever reason you have a <laughs> or you no, want to learn mean, Spanish. You might want to learn Spanish. I don't mean I'm randomly imagine having a, conversation. Having a dialogue I mean, with Cortana, I want, learning Spanish. Right? right? Wouldn't but that why be cool? Wouldn't this? Well, why isn't this like we have? In other words, th there's something about these assistants where they've basically failed. Um, they're used to play, or start a playlist or you know, start some music playing, ask the weather. 
tell me a joke. I mean, what's, what's the, we're talking about like 10 functions basically that most people use these things for mm -hmm. billions and billions of investments from all these companies. And this is what we have. We have a thing that can crack a joke and tell us the weather. No, no, but be patient. Um, I think this is imminent. What he's saying is that this stuff is dead. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but everybody's things, saying that, but that's without this, that's because my, uh, you know, Amazon lost $10 billion on a, right. Right. Uh, right. You know, court, he's easy for, Microsoft is it's dead because it yeah. is for Microsoft. We tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't you work. Know? But they they but stopped is, too soon. This, Add how is this any AI right. to this? That's, that's I'm just exactly. saying. They stopped that's too exactly soon. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yep. I I don't understand but, why this isn't the interface. But I, believe right? me, or Apple. It's just a matter of time. Apple and Google and Amazon are going to do it. I guarantee you. There's just a matter of time before they add. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the distinction here is that the old systems, which were machine learning models, right? I mean, all of mm -hmm. them were. We had voice before before machine learning models for voice. Right. It was really bad back when you had to train it. You know, it, we stopped needing to train it when they started using these uh, adversarial network approaches to machine learning to give up where they were able to train against a lot of voice data. So it worked quite reliably. The real change here is the large language model, the GPT style thing, where you have you have some concept of context, although the context is still quite primitive, and you have a much larger vocabulary and probabilistic estimation of what the what the statement is about. Right? It's it's now indexed the language well enough to know what the next words are likely to be and what the intended meaning is. It could read your mind. You know, I, anyone is there, there a technical I, reason, though, Richard, why? I mean, I understand they're not going to rush this because it could be a disaster. We've already learned. I would argue they are rushing it. But I okay. just going to say, are I, well, you I mean, kidding me? I mean, the, the addition <laughs> yeah. of ML, more sophisticated large language models to uh, yeah, right. voice clients. But I bet, and I so I understand they might want to say, well, gosh, you know, we don't want them to be chatty Cathy. How do we, you right. know, how do we make this work? But there's no, is there a technical reason why they couldn't do it? It's not the CPU. Sure. The, because the system doesn't actually have any intent, it baffles you with a lot of words. Right. That's literally what it's doing. If you look yeah. at its response, is it's really throwing a bunch of sentences at you like a, 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 a high school student who hasn't done his homework and needs to say <laughs> something. Right. No, but I, I'm just thinking, so, okay, obviously, when you set a timer... You don't want to say. Let's talk about the nature of time. You, well, you except, okay, but, you know, but, but, you but know when what? you but when you ask it, but how old is Richard is... Burton? It could say something much more useful. The kind of thing Bing Chat search results might I, say, which is you actually just highlighted my biggest complaint about these things. So I'll ask them. I'll you ask. I'm trying to think about how the oh this nowadays they I... say. Hey, by the way, did you know you can also find out what color shirt you're wearing tomorrow? Just no, it's it, Google. That. Don't show me this photo anymore on a, a smart display. Oh yeah, I can't. Do okay, that. just to be sure, you want me not to show you this photo anymore? Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So they okay. could be better. I will not show you this. What What are you talking about? Just do it. But adding what, adding what, uh, what large language models to that could make that better, right? Oh God, I hope so. That and makes it's not. Me crazy. I mean, it's not an issue of the CPU in these things because it's not doing anything but hearing your trigger word yeah. and then sending sure. the rest back to the home office. So it's the but home office. Those, it could be the cost. Those, well, those things you're making, they don't require any contact, right? <clears throat> yeah. Well, but again, I often, and we've all given up, but in the past, I still, so, I've okay, asked them I, factual information. You know, I still do from this, time to time. To me, one of the big conversations we have in the Microsoft space especially, but also just in the broader world, but, but because Microsoft missed out on mobile, right? Microsoft missed out on web search and, and doesn't dominate the web, you know? Uh, is, well, what's the next wave? And whatever that thing is, you know, Microsoft wants to be part of that thing. Like, what's the thing that's going to do to mobile what mobile did to PC, right? Not, it didn't replace it. I mean, well, it did, actually. It's, the PC still exists, obviously. It's not like the PC goes away. But now the volume platform for personal computing is mobile or whatever, right? And so there have been things like IoT, which, you know, from a numbers perspective makes sense. You know, VR, which never made any sense. Um, and now people are talking about AI. But, you know, I think... AI is something like voice assistance where it just becomes a part of, it becomes the part of all those other things, right? That AI will be embedded in everything. It will become an ingredient, you know, if you will, of all this stuff. And that, that's why the, the, the crapping on personal assistance doesn't make sense to me because this is the thing that will finally make that thing make sense. Honestly, um, this quote from right? Satya Nadella is going to be his Steve Ballmer on the iPhone quote, I think.
Oh, uh, because he, he was right. <laughs> Bomber was not right on the iPhone. He was. Uh, he was absolutely right. What was the quote? The quote was, "It costs too much." Okay, you're saying because right. uh, he was right on that, and they dropped the price. But it, but he they also literally dropped the price by thirty three percent. He also less, said two months later, and it doesn't have <laughs> it, a keyboard. And our business own, okay. uh, users don't want keyboards. Well, and we're doing well. mighty fine with Windows Phone. All of this was in the same quote. So that yes. one little part, yeah, maybe they should have. They, Leo, like bucks all was people too much. trying to prove a point, I'm selective here. So <laughs> the point is, and the iPhone now costs twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> And yeah, sells yeah, yeah. quite well. In fact, it's outselling sure. Windows Phone last time I checked. I'll have to look that one up. But I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying, I think Satya yeah, yeah. might be as wrong on this as Balmer was. I don't know what possessed this man to say this to the Financial Times, other than the fact that, like you said, Microsoft is the one company they don't in the have group it. that is not, is not really doing yeah. it anymore. But, but and, I, and by the way, and I, I'm not suggesting that they should bring Cortana back, put it back on the Windows taskbar, blah, 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 whatever. I don't mean it like that. But that kind of natural voice interaction with people, which, by the way, was something Microsoft tested as an add-on for Windows Mobile back in the, I mean, a million years ago, like early days of Windows Mobile, uh, is still the, the right thing in a lot of places, right? It's the right thing in a car. It's the right thing if you're an older person. It's the right thing if you're away from a device and you're in a room and you want the lights to be dimmer or the volume to be louder, whatever it is. Like it's it's obviously the right thing. And you don't have to have a brand. You don't have, you know, whatever it is you're using, uh, you know, it can be there. And and maybe that's the approach Microsoft has taken, but he's kind of crapping on this market because it, it sounds sour. Like we're not part of this anymore, so it was terrible. Like, we were the only ones smart enough to get out of it. And it's like, I don't know. I think this is going to work great for these other products. You know? Yeah, this guy say Q says bring Cortana back to Halo. Right. That's the only place Microsoft should bring Cortana back. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, I wonder. I mean, look at Microsoft has chat GPT. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think the reason we don't like Amazon's Echo and Google's voice assistant and Siri and in yeah. its day Cortana is because they were too stupid. But but if they if sudden I mean it, it might well be that Amazon of course Amazon did just lay off like twenty percent of the Echo team but no but I'm actually I'm agreeing with you I I, I think this is the thing that makes those things around. better and Microsoft doesn't have exclusive access to no but the they stuff. could bring back Cortana and and say yeah mm. it wasn't useful no, but, back then. well but where 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 would it make sense to do that I mean, you well, know what, what they does, already have in a way because that's what that's what the that's thing, the problem. The, the problem is, is where's the user facing thing where it makes sense. I mean, one of the things that integrating Cortana into Windows 10 proved was that integrating Cortana into Windows 10 made no sense at all. Mm. Uh, that's not the right place for voice. Well, it, it integrating being a relative point, like it was just there. It yeah. Didn't do anything, right. It, right. It, it, context is what you matters. could use it. Yeah, it you could use it to important. yeah use your voice to make an appointment. You know, I guess. But you know what? I, I think we're all Sometimes, anyone maybe. Depending yeah. on what app you're using, it we keep pulling up this, yeah, the you, Windows exactly. scheduling app. It was terrible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, most people are comfortable with clicking something on Google Calendar or whatever they're using and making the appointment. They just do that. It's a rote. Yeah. It's the way we work on PCs. It's just the way it is. I'm interested um, to look at like the integration they're doing with Dynamics. Yeah, because ERPs are complicated, and if you could right. actually add ask broad stroke business questions of an ERP system mm -hmm. and have it know where to fetch the data. To answer that question meaningfully, it's the same it's trust powerful. problem. It is totally. You're completely right, and yeah. we can't rely on this thing to get the date of an event right on the web. Uh, yeah. At what point do we trust it to uh, collate all that business information? No, I used to pay interns to collate that information. They got it wrong too. We <laughs> right <That's true>. <laughs> now you have no, a digital I, interview. You pay I the think left. they'd get it right more likely than an intern. Be, and and this is the reason it's the same it was the same thing with voice dictation voice dictation in a general way was often problematic but when it was in a specific field when it was in medicine for instance mm -hmm. it, or in law it was very good because it was a constrained domain and so in bi you're talking if yeah, you want to say well you know how many widgets did i sell last year and what's the trend that's a very constrained domain i think that's so, where it can get it right it's not going to make up facts in that context that's a good point. I mean, Microsoft kind of has had this technology for a while. This sounds a lot like the point behind the Microsoft graph, that you have this body of, uh, I don't want to call it intelligent, data inside of your business that comes from different sources. And you want to 
ask, you know, who is the person in my organization that knows the most about this topic because I'm writing or working on some project that involves this, that kind of thing. It's, it's kind of a neat, I, I think AI makes this better too. I, yeah, I, this is, this is an obvious area for, in fact, it's arguably an early example of AI. And that's sure the best already, use yeah. right now of chat GTP is summarize this text for me. Yeah. Uh, it does a very, it's very good at that. Um, you know, they just announced that Slack's going to have uh, access yep. to ChatGPT, and I applied immediately. And I said, what do you want to use it for? And I said, summarizing conversations. Because right. in that regard, I would trust it. Yeah, it's, a, okay. it's a much more limited domain, and it's very good at that. You know, where it gets in trouble is when you say, you know, as, uh, <laughs> as our friend Chris Breen did, who is Chris Breen? And it said he was right. dead. That's... <laughs> That's a terrible way to receive that news. Yeah. Yeah. What a shock. And it probably isn't Chris Breen that was dead. Just thought that one. I'm also, also, I have to say, I'm impressed that Christopher Breen is still alive. This is the guy who used to write for Macworld. Right? Yeah, the, yeah, he's a great yeah. guy, good friend. I like Christopher. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful yeah. guy. Well, he was yep. he was taking off on another, uh, this has all happened on Mastodon, so you might have missed it, but there, a, a professor of AI <laughs> had asked, had asked Bing. the little, uh, the little. Uh, <laughs> you might have missed. No, actually, you know what, Paul? You've been very active on Twitch social media. I have Thank just you. started auto-posting everything I write to Mastodon. So. I saw that. Oh, it's auto-posting. Oh, well. No, no, I'm writing on there. Yeah, I see well, you a lot. But no, no, I see That's you something there. I do on uh, Twitter as well, so I'm, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No, I'm aware of it. I'm Believe me. I see all. I know all. <laughs> okay. uh, at least when it comes to tooting. But uh, yeah. it was an AI professor who tooted that he'd asked ChatGPT about himself and was informed right. that he was dead. And then Chris did it. What? Same and thing. he was dead. I keep trying to get it to say I'm dead, but I haven't yet. So oh, I'm, uh, oh. there's a certain honor in having ChatGPT pronounce oh. your demise. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I am, I honestly I'm think, dead inside. Is that the same? Oh, dead inside. Yeah. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Um, I honestly think this is, this is going to be the savior of these voice assistants. They've just been too stupid up to now, but it has to be done I right. So no, that, that, that was sort of my original, I didn't say it that way, but yeah, that was what I was trying to get to. I, yeah, so I agree with you. I, 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 this is, this is, is going to what this, geez, let me form a sentence. Uh, ChatGTP, can you form an English sentence for me? Uh, this is what's going to make these things make more sense, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yep. The problem for, like, not just Microsoft Space, but the whole world is, and you just mentioned Slack is a good example. Every announcement we see this year is going to have the word AI in it. There's no doubt about it. So yeah. uh, we discussed this yeah. notion. Yeah, it's this of, year's blockchain, um, right? Yeah, my, yep, yep. Linux was like this one. You know, if you wanted to, you had a startup and, you wanted uh, investors. You were Linux, you know, or you were, you know, this is this. Or is you the were new, cloud. Mm -hmm. you this know, is the new hotness. So this is the flavor of the week. Yeah, Microsoft's been at this for a little while. They're heating that up. So the latest Microsoft 365 monthly roundup is all AI. It's AI features in Teams Premium, AI features in PowerPoint. You know, it kind of goes on and on. So mm. that's what's going to happen. But I, I just wonder who wrote the letter, right? Like. <laughs> The, right. the, there's the internet just, tidal wave letter from Gates where it's like everybody has to implement an internet feature even when it's bad. Right. And then there was the security, you know, the the trustworthy computing letter. Yep. Like, so who wrote the letter? Who, who has, wrote, yeah, who has that AI power? Yeah. I, I have to assume it came from Satya Nadella, right? I mean. Quite possibly. I'm mean, yeah. Bill's I there. To, but I don't know that he would write a letter for yeah, I, mean, I think they're trying to keep that one quiet. Um, yeah. <laughs> Completely parenthetically, though, this is why yeah. we love this beat. Because sure. stuff like this comes along and everything's up in the air. You know, throw it I, up in so the air. When, yes, my God, yes. Uh, when I got started in this industry, the PC revolution had already happened, right? Apple started, Microsoft started, DOS, Windows, PC versus Mac, and, and I missed it. And I... I devoured every book about that era that was ever written. Um, I, I I hated not being part of it. And I always felt bad about that. And then when my career started in the mid-1990s, um, you know, Windows 95 happened, the internet happened, Netscape, anti And all of a sudden I was in the middle of it and I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> like this is, you know, I and I was where I wanted to be, not at Microsoft or Apple, but oh, covering just, it. Uh, outside yeah. The, yeah, covering yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting because there are waves of that and you think you keep thinking or it's something as stupid as, you know, windows is obviously on the decline in the sense that it's not the center of personal computing. And you think, my God, well, it's over. Like, you know, we all going to start writing about smartphones or, you know, whatever the other nonsense. And the truth is it's uh, cyclical. You know, there are things like AI is going to dramatically impact windows. 
a product that, um, you know, has been around since 1985. Well, well and then uh, there's the question, can is can the incumbents capitalize or right. are they just going to stumble as which, by the way, they ha sort of have so far? Well, I, so yeah, so I, the, the, the truly, the companies you want to look up to are the companies like when Apple looked at the iPod and said, who, what's going to replace this? And they, and they decided it would be a phone. And they said, well, let's make a phone. Let's do it. Let's disrupt our own selves. You know, I think Microsoft's AI push here, although I think it's a little risky and it's been rushed out the door, is a good example of a company that is the Oldsmobile of technology that doesn't have a good impression with young people or whatever is not like a center of anyone's lives anymore, uh, is their attempt to reassert themselves. They are the second biggest tech company in the world. Right. Um, and it's, it, and it's, this is a helpful reminder that they're not IBM, right? Which was always their biggest pet peeve. Like we don't want to end mm -hmm. up like IBM and they kind of did. Right. So this is, I, I respect this attempt on that level of them trying to reassert their uh, influence over the industry. You know? I mean, they've been pouring energy into AI because it was an Azure consumer That's for right. a long time, right? They yep. need products that depend on Azure. Yes. Uh, and and they've been building a bunch of them. The thing that you've seen with the so-called economic downturn and the constraints right. is that they have now decided this one seems to have traction, the 100 yep. million users from ChatGPT. They've caught funding to a lot of those other experimental Azure consumers like HoloLens. Yeah. And right. and they're going to double down on this one. Okay. So this is very much direction. tied uh, to this Cortana thing. You know, do you, do, you know, why would Microsoft bring back Cortana? They wouldn't. But you know what Microsoft is going to... Microsoft Azure will be the thing that powers the AI bus company that does disrupt the industry, right? Yeah. That's, if it doesn't yeah, come they're, from they're Google and Microsoft... They're selling the picks and the Levi's, exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so, and this is the conversation we had about things in the past, like smart cars or whatever, where you may not see a Microsoft logo on a dashboard, right? It might be an Apple thing or a Google thing or whatever it is. But the back end for mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that goes through that car is going to be Microsoft. And, right. and this is a, and by the way, I'm describing IBM here, of course, but this is a, a very rich future for the company. Um, I, I appreciate they're trying to like, hey, Bing's still a thing, see? Yeah, okay, maybe. But I, I think the real um, success of this is going to be getting developers and customers to adopt this stuff through Azure. And, uh, and maybe one of them who doesn't have a market to protect like Microsoft and Google and Apple do, or Amazon, or whatever, will make this innovative thing that changes the world. And you need to have something as powerful and big as Azure on the back. You can't do it yourself. In yeah. a way, it, it just gets back to your original comment, Leo. That you know, normally incumbents do not disrupt their markets. Right. Right. Uh, but now we we're now experimenting with technologies that have such high infrastructure costs. You need yeah. to be a cloud company essentially to pull it up. Yeah. And so there's only three players. Right. Right. Yeah, that is the big difference, isn't there? Although you couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't have made the iPhone as a garage startup either. No. I mean, no, I know, but it's still, uh, well, this is easier than that, frankly. But no, it, especially it, because you have enabling technologies from companies like Microsoft. There were smartphones before the iPhone, right? From a variety of companies, different mm -hmm. platforms. There were app models, all kinds of things. I mean, what set the iPhone apart was they looked at that stuff and said, well, this is crap. Let's make something that's better in every way. So the, it's still it, it's still that kind of disruptive example. Yeah. It's perfect. I mean, it's, it's the ultimate and one. And nowadays I mean, you've got people like, uh, you know, Nothing, the Nothing phone, the Essential mm -hmm. phone. You've got other companies trying, you know, scram. None of them have trying, succeeded. But trying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it is possible yeah. to do. It's a little bit more possible to do that. The fair yeah. phone. Well, you'll, so. you'll have, there are um, uh, indie video games that take off and become very successful. Yeah. They may not rival, you know, Call of Duty or Warcraft or anything, something like that, but it's still possible to, uh, you know, well, the, so actually that's a good example. And now that I think of it, um, Fortnite or this actually was Fortnite wasn't first. I'm sorry. Uh, this, this notion of battle Royale came out of nowhere, basically like PUBG maybe was one of the first ones. Um, it was, yeah. Yeah. So that came out of nowhere um, and completely disrupted Call of Duty and other shooters, right? To the point where they had to integrate that style of gameplay into their own games. I mean, that was a good, that's actually a great example. And Fortnite overwhelmed PUBG with a yes. with yep. a different play system, right? With right. building. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, because that actually that game was originally just about building. And yeah. I think they saw PUBG and they changed it to yeah. make it more like that. Yeah, I think. I think that's the story. No, no, I think it's fair. So... And, and 
<laughs> and they were they were running on somebody's infrastructure, obviously. That's right. Yeah, like, they sure were. They were running on, and likely on Amazon. Even something like PUBG was so big that there were at least three quarters where Microsoft said that an unnamed third party impacted Xbox revenues in such a dramatic way that they had to call it out. And they wouldn't say what it was, but it was PUBG. Right. That's hysterical. Yeah. And I remember how dominant and exciting PUBG was right up till Fortnite came along. Right until Fortnite happened, that, that, that was the end of that. that and now there's, you know, there's so many of those games now, um, yeah. you know, but whatever. Uh, so Fortnite is a, a force unto itself, but... But that's um, actually, but yeah, so, that's also uh, instructional because yep. uh, PUBG was the first. It's often not the first, as you point right. out. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it, it's, that wins. That wins, right. So yeah. there's, there's some company, some guy in a garage, or some uh, whatever it is, some small team. I, it, there's no doubt there's going to be this incredible innovation that will occur in the AI space. Um it's, it doesn't mean Microsoft or Google or Amazon can't <laughs> do, you know, right. truly innovative and amazing work. And, and doesn't and mean that possibly Bing, it's running on one of their clouds. It's just but that, I think, yeah, that, I think that's going to be the ultimate outcome here. Mm. Um, it's, 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 the, it's, I didn't read the full uh, article in the Wall Street Journal, but I think one of the problems for Google was it's hard to, you know, disrupt yourself. You don't, this thing is powerful. It's a little dicey yet. It's early, but they, they dominate search so completely Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't want to throw a wrench into that. You know, it's hard for a company like that to do that. But here's for the them to react as strongly as he is, is like they're abundantly aware that they, oh, yeah. search is a long way removed from its original intent, yeah. right? It became yeah. primarily a vehicle for advertising. It became then shift. They, they know this is existential. As we said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is yep. ex existential for them. It's interesting because AWS has been dominant in cloud and, right. and much as Google's been dominant in search, it has looked unassailable. Mm -hmm. But and then what's kind of interesting? Do you think that the, ultimately they're going to win in this? No, because they didn't. They didn't do what Google and 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 Microsoft did with the TPUs and you know building those special machines just for building ML databases yeah. and things like that. Right? I, I, I wouldn't count them out. I I, I I feel like they're powerful enough to recover, in the same way that I sort of feel like Google is powerful enough in search to recover. Right? That it is an opportunity um, for the the also rants. It, it to, sure is to yeah. catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I love, there's somebody, um, there's a uh, subreddit called Data is Beautiful, <laughs> okay, which I love. And yeah. uh, there's constantly posts of their videos of the shift in, well, as an example, one I just saw was market share, OS market share. And so they'll start yeah. in like 1981 yeah. and they'll have a pie chart. And then the video yep. goes and year like by Windows, year Windows, Windows, Windows. And, it goes, <laughs> and Windows slowly yeah. envelops the world. Sure. And it really get, it get, points out to you that you know, you could be MS DOS in, or you know, I don't know what in. Uh, not, I guess Atari actually when this started. Sure. Atari was this big wedge of the yep. Atari OS, and you can be you know, Atari um, in 1981. The Atari 800 was going to be the first IBM PC. They already reached a deal. Wow! And it was the whoever the CEO of uh, uh, IBM was at the time said, are you telling me that the world's biggest computer maker can't make a computer? OMG. <laughs> and that's why they made their own thing. And they had to rush it to market, which is why they did off the shelf parts. I, which I is had why no was, idea. Yeah. And, Crazy. And you and I both, well, I know you might've been an Amiga guy by then, but I was a big Atari well, guy in the early days. I was a Commodore guy and then yeah. an Amiga guy, but I actually, you know, looking, not knowing more about it now, the 800 as the predecessor to the Amiga was clearly the superior machine from a hardware perspective. Yeah, I was a service guy then. I repaired them all. Right? <laughs> That's great. My first computer. The, the, yeah. The 800 XL was by far the most durable machine. The, the nice. 64 wasn't bad. The, I made a lot of money repairing the 1541s because they didn't have back socks on the rails. <laughs> Those so were right. search and stroke the head right off the end of the rails. That was yep. good for. If you bump the table, you can throw the head off. Yeah. Those things yeah. were horrible. You yep. want to? You want to see? Yeah. I found the. Uh, here's. Let me see if I can show you the video because this is this is. Um, Oh, this it's, is the OS market share. Yeah, the OS market share. It's instructional yeah. in the sense that um, nothing is nothing is permanent, right? So and I uh, was a Trist off guy. So TR, T go. yeah, Trash Pope, 80, TRS your 80. Your Pope could be, nice. Pope could be is, right in the heart there, Leo. This is 1978, yeah. it starts. 40% yeah. uh, of the market. Let's see if I can play this video. Uh, and then Commodore's growing. There's Commodore sure. growing. There's Apple DOS. Atari DOS is the pink one. See, it's getting bigger and bigger as uh, Trash DOS goes away. Sure. Um, I wish I could move this a little faster, but you see, and we're now in the 80s. 
and all of a sudden IBM MS DOS with the IBM PC. Well, Comm Commodore wins right there. Yeah, <laughs> and then stuff in '85 and the C64 is the winner. And then the Amiga happened, and that was the end of that. <laughs> so, Apple's yeah. shrinking, MS DOS, mm -hmm. and PC DOS is shrinking too. MS DOS is yeah. is kind of taken over. We're now in the, in the late '90s, it's, uh, late sure. '80s. Now let's go into the '90s, and uh, boy, boy, that blue slice, which is MS DOS. Right. Yeah, that thing will never lose to anything. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's a good example of the company disrupting itself, Oops. right? I just killed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. sorry. I, I messed up. <laughs> we'll never know what we, happened we, we after 1992. Well, sorry. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, I got a book coming out uh, soon about what happened. And uh, <laughs> Forget the uh, animated graphic. Uh, let, go me, the uh, let me, let me spoiler hysterical. alert you. Uh, what did I do? Yeah, I things change. Yeah. If you want for the whole thing, kids... Go to Data is Beautiful subreddit. Data. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait a minute. We're let's see. How do I how do I speed it up? There it is. I get back into the back to the future. Uh, and you see Windows. Okay. Is so there's to Windows take over. taking over for DOS. Yep. Yeah. And there's yep. Windows NT, Windows ninety eight, Windows ninety five. Linux yep. is shrinking. Mac actually becomes all just so, Windows. Yeah. It's tell me there'll be Windows. no line for ME. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? There is no line for ME. Well, there it is. There it is. Oh, I mean, little line, little line, point seven percent. Little bye, bye, yeah. bye, little line. Terrible. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. These things. Nothing can go wrong now. I mean, uh, the I mean, data is beautiful. Yeah, is all about data the visualization. The dominance of XP is astonishing. Look at that. Right? Just yeah. 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 This is two thousand eight. Yeah. So here I, comes Vista. I think the animations, the visualizations like this of data can be very instructive. Yeah. Because you. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in this, so we don't see it. We're like fish in water. We don't see the water. But no, these when are you the waves that we swam through. Yeah, and it really is right. a big one. Um, Mac OS is is starting to grow. We're in the 2015 time frame. This yeah, is no, no. Mac OS times. was pretty much the same for about <laughs> for a long time. Years there. Yeah, yeah. It Linux still much. a tiny slice. That's the little orange slice at the top there. Yeah. Windows 10, Windows 7. See the I mean, red? Windows overall, uh, you know, there was a point where it was, you know, 85% or something. It's it's down. It's it's probably closer to 70. Here comes Windows days. 11. I mean, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're in the present. So what we need is this graphic, but for uh, all platforms. So include like mobile and, you know. Yeah. That. If, and that's, yeah. You leave that was the big point. Of iOS I Android, think if you did yeah. mobile, uh, all of those other slices would be so small. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Wouldn't be that yeah. interesting. Uh, well, it, I mean, it'd be fascinating just to watch the shift, right, from desktop to mobile. I'll ask them. Okay. I'll, I'll ask the subreddit. Hey. Are we done with AI? Have we talked it through today? Yeah, uh, just uh, real quick, I just, if you want to go see some of this and it may be a different style of presentation, uh, Brave Search and DuckDuckGo both added similar features where they try to answer your question at the top, they cite the sources, and then they give you the. Uh, I told the you. I like this metaphor, being an AI obviously doing this as well. This yeah. is. Give me your summary. Mm -hmm. Give it footnotes. This is what I pulled it from. Oh, do you, yeah. And do you need more? Here's the list. I told right. you this but, months you know. ago with Neva, but nobody listened. You and your Neva and your Mastodon and <laughs> like whatever. You know what? Are Linux, you? not your Lisp and your. Yeah, I do have a. I guess I have a. Uh, you really? What are you? What are you? I don't want to be in the mainstream. <laughs> Next, it'll be Grep and Pearl. Yeah, I did Pearl. Pearl's old. I, I did that a long time ago. Grip. I'm a very. I'm good at grip. In fact, wow. uh, the guy who wrote the book on grip, Jonathan Friedel, I have an autographed copy of his Mastering nice. Grip, uh, second edition, uh, somewhere hmm. because. Uh, and he sent me a nice little note because oh, I. Yeah. I again, <laughs> I've been recommending it for years. <laughs> I'm a big Emacs fan too. You might as well throw that one in. As well, yep, Emacs. but I, you know why? Because I, I learned very early on in technology, it isn't <laughs> always the biggest slice of the pie that's the best. McDonald's sells uh, more hamburgers than sure. anybody else. The, are the, they the, the best? Are you suggesting that the Ford Escort was never the best car in the world? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, exactly. Uh, I like. I'm an iconoclast. I think is the yeah. Oh, that's, that's the term for that. Um, it's probably foolish given uh, what I do for a living. I probably should be more mainstream. But. You know what, though? I, okay, so I, I'm going to just disagree with you only because based on my own personal experience, there, I, there was a period in time when I thought to myself, the biggest mistake I ever made was latching my career onto Microsoft and Windows. Like, I should have been more broad. And I realize now, all these year, years later, no, that was actually the right, that was the right approach. The world doesn't need another goon to write 
keep it like reviews of hard drives or mobile devices or, you know, whatever. Like I just, I, I, you having a kind of a, a point of view, uh, especially if you can make people actually think differently, right? Not just because it's different, but because you're on to something maybe. I think that's important. Well, I definitely have a point of view. <laughs> sure. <laughs> There's no, no doubt about that. Yeah. We don't, no one knows what it is, but you know, it's out there. Yeah. Oh, oh, you <laughs> know what it is. Emacs, Lisp, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Neva, <laughs> yep. no, it's, Fast I, Mail. Uh, I think it's important to make people, because people get, they get tunnel vision about stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I honestly uh, feel like my job is not to find the biggest market leader, but to find the best. Right. I mean, you don't go. you, you guys do the same way. You, you always yeah. look no, for the best. that's the right way to think of it. The best yep. coffee, you know, the best yep. uh, pizza, the best um, word processor. You know, that's, that's. Finding best is an interesting problem. Well, it is because Emacs, while best for me, obviously is far from best from anybody else. But mm, sure. <laughs> you know, so it really, uh, that's true too. Yeah, but and I don't all those I, VI guys that are so happy. I don't go around, you know, saying you should all be using Leo, Emacs. You gotta, you gotta someday on your Windows machine just open a terminal and type in WinGet and then call me a week and later and tell me how it went because you will <laughs> love it. I've used WinGet. You will I've love used it. WinGet. I got. I got. Uh, WinGet is a way WSL to update running. every app on your computer, no matter where it's it came from. It's the long needed package manager for Windows. Yep. But I have to say, before that, I used Chocolatey. And of Very course, good. on every other operating system, I've actually had real package managers since day one. Okay. It's well, only been uh, Windows Get, that hasn't, really. Yeah. Right. Uh, Winget is incredible. No, it's, it's about time. Type, it, yeah. It's the type of thing you would really. Yeah. Enjoy. No, I use apt-get uh, and uh, pa Pac-Man and, you sure. know, the real the real deal. Going back to uh, Gentoo and building all my own binaries from scratch. Well, right. But I mean, so on Windows, of course, you can download <laughs> stuff from the web. You can get stuff from the store. Yeah. Winget just kind of handles all of it. I know it's great. <laughs> it's, it's it's really kind of that's neat. Right. no, it is. It's nice. It's cute to see you guys yeah. finally. Yeah, you know. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Seeing the value of. A well, package I don't know manager. if you've ever heard of a package manager, but we just got it on Windows. And let me tell you something. It's so cute. I have seen the future. No, it is. It's transformational. I agree, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. When they announced Winget, I said, "Half ah, hallelujah, finally," because sure. chocolatey was you know barely everything. You know, this is this is good. So Winget is pretty complete now. That's great. Yeah, it's That's incredible. Great. That's wonderful. Yep. Uh, I did download, uh, contrary to my, you know, plan of only mm -hmm. using the best stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, I did. Hold on. I did download Outlook on the Mac. It's actually not bad. It's pretty good. If, it's a nice app. Yeah. And actually, fact, we talked about it on Mac Break Weekly yesterday. If you're using, if you're connecting with an Exchange server, I guess Alex Lindsay's uh, company mm -hmm. uses Exchange. Outlook is light years better. Is that is that right? right. For, yeah. Well, Richard will have to answer that one. I wouldn't go near an exchange server if my life depended on it. But uh, remember, I'm the guy turning mine off. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, and yes, definitely. Outlook was the client you wanted for exchange yeah. server. I, from uh, the is perspective, it really the client you want for exchange online? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, but the question is: Windows, they're giving it away for free. Is it right. worth that price? <laughs> wow. So I, I mean, I don't use it. I don't use the Mac right uh, for that much, but I. Looking at it compared to what we have in Windows, I think it looks great. And this long overdue new Outlook client that is still not complete, you know, still not ready for prime time, is very much based on the web stuff. It's it's clearly a web app, um, which is fine. I don't have a problem with it. I just think the Outlook app for the Mac looks nice. It's just a nice native looking app. Like it looks mm -hmm. at home on the Mac. Yeah, it's M1, like that kind of M1 thing. compabile. It's a... Yep. So yeah. you're saying so. it's actually better... Uh, see, I, I wouldn't put those words in my mouth. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying it looks nicer than any version of Outlook on Windows. Wow! But I, I don't use it. That's yeah, kind of stunning. Yeah. Why does uh, why did why does Microsoft keep, they did this before right well, when they did Touch uh, First so on the iPad? Right? It's a native app. I mean, it's yeah. a native app. You know, it's um, I th there's a there's some. Microsoft design stuff that I really do like. I I don't I think I'll look on the web looks nice to me. It's fine. I mean, it's it's you see like a similar a similar kind of like a set of icons and and textiles and so forth between apps on Windows 10 or 11 and apps on the web that they have. 
And it, it looks, you know, it's fine. And actually probably on mobile as well. But um, I think the reason the Mac version shines just from the way it looks is because they just went native with it and they're using whatever the native capabilities are there for the UI. And it just looks nice. It's clearly not a skinned thing that exists elsewhere. It looks like a looks like a real map Mac. It app, strikes you know? me that this is not built by the Outlook team, but rather built by some uh, Mac folks. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, there yeah. are plenty of yeah. Mac people at Microsoft. I mean, there's no lack. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. It, I mean, it, that, the point is like... It, it was diff built by a different group of people. Right. And they were coming at it from a native Mac development perspective. Yep. Which, you know. It's is the right way to do it. it, it well, Let's, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Maybe. I mean, I, there, I feel like some cross-platform developer environments like Flutter is a good example. Do a good job of providing what I'll call native-like. Or just native mm -hmm. UI. Cross-platform works well. Maui will probably get there you know at, at some point um there are super uh, there's very strong advantages to doing cross-platform obviously right i mean obviously um but if you want if you could I, I suppose if you just separate out the ui framework and everyone can somehow use the same back end maybe there's an approach there that makes sense you know I, I don't know but all i can say is this app looks great i you know i'm I'm really into the cross-platform stuff, but I look at this app like, oh, that's really it's nice. It's a native Mac, Mac yeah. app. Yeah, show. there's something about it. It looks good. Yeah. I love it. So, yeah. Not using it. Don't have a Mac. Nope. I'm not going to use you, it. I if just, you had a Mac, though, nice. you would use it, right? Do you use, out, you use Outlook on the PC. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't. On PC. <laughs> <laughs> I was See, I don't, use I've, I, I'm kind of uh, on record as saying I don't, I think Outlook's a terrible yeah, mail client, but uh, I use, on the Mac, um, it's not bad actually. I mean, it's fine. I, I'm I on the record of saying website. Outlook 64 threads, none of them are for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's one good reason. Right, right. right. Yeah, that PST fi PST file is not going to feed itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you got to you got to keep that thing going. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, I don't know. But yeah, I come from it being an Exchange server owner, and so of course I used Outlook. I'm right. now softening as a, becoming an M365 person, saying. Do I really need this anymore? What They're would you use really instead? Really steering me hard to the web client. Web client, yeah. The web client, yeah. The that's what the web client, truthfully, yeah. that's what everybody does these days. Very few people, I think. Yep. Only us I old timers. I pump all my email through a single interface and use that one interface on the web, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? at, at least then, when I'm running out of memory, I don't have to close multiple apps. It's going to be the browser that crashes first anyway and clears <laughs> up all the memory. So. There's never any guesswork. <laughs> What's doing it now? Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. This is the it's always the problem. The fatalism yeah. of the computer user. Yeah, <sighs> there's Task Manager, and yeah, and I'm, there's Edge up to to twelve gigabytes. It's like <laughs> it's time to close them all. God friend. bless its little time heart. To close them all. Its evil uh -oh. little black heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what memory you've lost or where you've lost it, but you're giving <laughs> it back to me now. <laughs> oh boy. End process. <laughs> Uh, all right. So that's good. Task, uh, task manager needs like uh, sound effects when you do that. Like it could make the Pac-Man dying sound or yeah. just like a sad whimper, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, let's get, uh, Xboxy. Okay. So yeah, I'm sure you've all heard the news. This could have been the top story. Uh, Reuters reports that multiple sources tell it that the EU is likely to approve Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard, right? And for all the reasons we've already talked about that, the concessions it would need to make for this to be truly anti-competitive are obvious, and it's making them. And um, it has apparently, another report says the EU has now delayed their announcement about this, probably because it leaked. Um but uh, we'll see. Hopefully in the next week or so, we'll get the official word on that. <clears throat> so that's good. And it's, um, in, a, in, a, in an announcement that surprised not, but Paul Throt, not at all. Not me at all, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, not, you I'm said not, this, and I, I was skeptical, but I'm glad. Now, I don't know if this means the FTC will change their right. tune. But. Well, you know, so the FTC had originally reached out to the EU to work in concert, and that stopped. So I think they caught wind of the fact that, you know, the EU must have been like, guys, um, what they're doing is fine. Like, it's this is going to work. I, I suspect Sony was making calls <laughs> saying, you're getting awfully close to getting it, making us have to do things here. Right. And clearly, That's the right. discovery process that Microsoft <clears throat> kicked off yep. is really what's agitated everyone. And finally, they're like, please, please make this stop. Yeah. 
Right. That it, that may be what makes Sony just give up on this. Is yeah, they don't want not, those emails out. That's there. right. Because it, it makes it, it makes them look terrible because they are terrible. Because yeah. they're yeah. terrible. They are terrible. A um, couple of Halo things going on. Um, Halo Infinite, we talk about this a lot, got off to a rough start, um, and it has been rough ever since. <laughs> so, um, however, I think it was today or yesterday, they just released uh, the, what they call, you know, this is a big thing in video games now, like Season 3, right? Um, which uh, is probably, they call it the Spring Update or the whatever the thing is called, doesn't matter. Anyway, it adds new maps, new games, mo- uh, well, a new game mode, um, New equipment, new weapons, new cosmetics, et cetera, et cetera. So for the Halo fans that I still hear from, I think like a lot of people, I kind of gave up on this. Um, I feel like, I think we talked about this last week maybe, you know, the first three Halo games, classic. The last three games, like, eh, you know, I don't know. I, I appreciate the Halo-ness of this game, if that makes sense. Like, it, it, it they really nailed the halo look and feel the music that you know you're running through a level and it starts building like i i that's something halo was always really good at um and it, it feels very it's a good entry in the series but i just feel like the world's kind of moved on unfortunately for them um but this apparently does a big is a big step forward for them and uh is positive news if you're a halo fan so i won't begrudge them that um and then uh, separate from this microsoft announced that uh, they call these things creations. These are mostly m- multiplayer maps, but Halo players have now created over 1 million, I'm going to call them maps, using something called Forge Beta. So Forge was something that I think debuted as far back as Halo 3. It's basically a way for anyone out in the community to create their own maps, and then they can create playlists where you can play these maps with your friends, right, or with anybody online. So um, Forge for Halo Infinite is currently in beta and uh, it's apparently going gangbusters because there's been a lot of content created there. So that's that's great, right? That's that's good stuff. It's always good when you can make your own lives. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is the second month in a row where it looks like we're going to get three uh, selections of Game Pass titles through the Xbox Game Pass right across uh, Xbox, Xbox, PC, and Ultimate, um, including Cloud. So. Uh, they've announced six new games that are coming basically in kind of that middle third of the month. Oh, oh be still Valheim my heart. is in there. Be still my heart, my game. Dead, has Dead Space 2 and 3. Remember, Dead Space was just remastered or remade, I guess. So these are the other two Dead Space games have been added. Uh, Civilization 6. I can't tell you how many times one of these things comes out, and I'm like... Nope, <laughs> you know, and then this time <laughs> I'm, I'm like, it's worse. Hey, okay. oh, I like download are... it each time and install yeah. it, and then go, yeah. nope. <laughs> yeah, what is this? Yeah. So this is this is like this is a really good drop for these guys. Valheim um, is the way, amazing. Valheim's so yeah. Good. So completely separate from this, uh, I've been working on the book, uh, the Windows 11 book, and I had to write the Xbox app chapter, which involves. Uh, games you purchase from Microsoft that are Xbox games, not just any PC games. Like, it doesn't matter if it came from the store. It has to be an Xbox game for the PC. But also, especially, uh, PC Game Pass uh, and uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, right, which includes the PC game. So you can download those games to your PC and play them live. And uh, Xbox Cloud Gaming, which is the game streaming service, which is part of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, right, which you can stream to any device basically these days, but... Obviously, for the book, I'm looking at Windows. So I signed up for Game Pass Ultimate so I could experience all of that. I did this with the account I used for the book, not with my main account, because I wanted it to be clean as well, because on my old account, I have all this stuff on it. All those Call of Duty achievements. Yeah, yeah. So I played several cloud cloud gaming games, meaning I streamed them, right? Uh, Quake, I think, was one. Um, Ori... Um, asphalt, oh, not asphalt. Uh, one of the Forza games. I don't remember the exact list. I'm sorry, but you know what? I got to say, the biggest issue I've had with this thing so far has just been lag or latency. Um, I haven't, I haven't played like deathmatch, you know, in a, a third person shooter or anything like that. I think that's still going to be an issue. But these games all played fantastically well, and I don't know if it's the internet connection here is really clean or what. I, I and this was just on a standard business class laptop. It's probably two or three years old. There's nothing going on. Uh, with it hardware wise, um, I was really impressed with the performance of this thing. So, you know, if you're kind of on the fence with this stuff, you know, you can you can test it for a, a dollar or move to Mexico, or move to or, and or move to Mexico. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come here, just oh, use my internet. It'll be fine. Stadia went so well, so you would actually figure that. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. The late it's, lament. It's, I mean, I'm, you, you, and that's, <laughs> you're talking EA play as well. And electronic arts does not right. have a great history. Uh, if it's working, it's working and, and not just working from Philadelphia, right? Like right. not working in, in a big American city. You're down, yeah. you're down in Mexico. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I yeah. was great impressed to know. by it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to spend some time with it. I have it for the month. I might as well, you know, um, yeah, works great. Fun. Yeah. I mean, there are, there, look, I mean, Stadia is, it's sad. It's actually Stadia worked pretty well. It's Stadia just, might have been issues. the best of the lot. Yeah, there were other technolo issues. Uh, technology perspective. Amazon's yeah. Luna is pretty good. I like GeForce now. And I the mean, re the reason, you know, it's a Luna and Stadia both had or have the same advantage, which is that their controllers, if you bought, use their controller, because you can use any controller, but if you use theirs, it connects directly to the internet. And it, it really helps with that lag latency issue. It was really kind of a neat thing. In fact, when Stadia crashed and burned, I wrote something saying, Microsoft, you gotta, you got to steal this idea. This is what's going to put cloud gaming over the top. Um, although, like I said, uh, they something has gone right because it's it's working pretty damn well right there. Yeah, so uh, it's amazing. Third, Again, know, we were talking before done. the show about how everything's changed. You know, now I can do Zoom calls with somebody in New yeah. Zealand and yeah. Mexico with no latency. It sounds great. It works beautifully. It um, looks great. You know, this is another example. given given what we have to work with. Who would have thought we'd <laughs> yeah. be able to do you know high end gaming? Uh, I know. I got this Acer Chromebook for review. Mm -hmm. I got to send it back. And uh, the whole right. pitch is, it, you know, it comes, it, it'll work with any of these streaming things, including games, right. you know, uh, games, game pass. But yeah, uh, I, I played, I did a demo on Sunday and the, um, mm -hmm. asked the tech guy of uh, playing that, that hot new game, that oh. new survival game. Uh, what's yeah. it called? Oh, For Sons cool. of the Forest uh, in oh, GeForce Now like on a Chromebook. Okay. Uh, on Wi-Fi. So this is a P this is a PC game streaming from a PC, data center somewhere. PC triple A game, and of and course what did you the way, get for the way was it 1080p or what was no the 4K, 4K, <laughs> 4K. The way and the way yeah. these games uh, with GeForce Now work is you've got it's just actually it's just like Xbox Game Pass. You've got like a whole game of yeah. 4090 yeah, dedicated yeah, yeah. Yep. to you. And PC games honestly probably have better scaling anyway uh in some ways you know streaming a pc game might even make more sense the xbox game pass or um, cloud gaming stuff is all console games yeah um it's pretty it's really interesting yeah this is a pc game um yeah on Let's geforce see. now and you get a dedicated ray tracing 4090 <laughs> <laughs> it's ex i mean it's expensive though sure. i can't remember what the monthly is it's more than a game than game pass but it's still yeah yeah. We live in well, very interesting it's, times. It, yeah. It's cool that we have that kind of choice of scalability, if you want. And it. Richard, this is just client net, client server computing. This is just yeah. the, the, sure. the mainframe. Right. It's not end tier, it's two tier. <laughs> with, my, with my terminal, <laughs> yeah. my thin terminal yeah. running uh, on my right. desktop. And we've been See, here before. Sun was right about the net PC. They yeah. had it all along. Yeah. They had it all along. The it was problem just is they had it in 1996. Early. Yeah, it was just too early. <laughs> it was just yeah. like 25 years I mean, years that's ago. essentially what this Acer Chromebook is, is a net PC, right? Yeah. Well, you know what? Actually, it's way more powerful, right? Because it is. It had an The I5 processor, it, RAM, and, yeah. storage, and, yeah. and Chrome OS, yeah. you know, we can joke about it compared to Windows or Mac OS, but honestly, it's quite capable. It's Linux. And it's, compared to, it, yeah. it, it is something, there is something on the client. It's not just yeah. a. No, no. It's a real yeah. deal. In fact, you can run Linux yeah. on it and Android and apps and stuff. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right, Andrew. You can run Visual Studio Code on it and you can write web apps with it. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. as I would do, uh, put Linux <laughs> on it and log into a server running VSC, okay. uh, the server version of oh, VSC. VSC. Well, no, but you run install Linux on it, install the Linux version of Visual Studio you Code. Could, you could run code na natively, but, you know, yeah, yep. exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, we it's... But I, I guess kind of playing off of this games over the internet, you can you can run a VSC server, and um, and then anything you use sure. from an iPad to a Chromebook to your laptop just logs right. into that server and you're running vi Visual Studio Code. And the <sighs> same instance, Scott McNeely, really. That model is bogus. <laughs> it's bogus. Uh, well, when I blog, I, of course you, you know, think that you sell big iron. <laughs> when I blog, yeah. I usually SSH into my server running Emacs and run and or I could use tra Emacs Tramp and do it locally. But usually I just log into the Emacs on the server and blog there because it's. How know, do you easier. find that performance to be fine? Yeah, fine, good. Yeah, 
I mean, look, okay, like Emacs is not exactly Call of Duty. It's not. No, no, but that's that's almost the point, right? That's that's why a Chromebook is probably a good solution oh, for a absolutely. lot of people because yeah. most people aren't doing high end. Yeah. We're yeah. not making videos. We're not rendering anything. We're not architects or right, engineers. You know? These days, we could be doing all that in the cloud anyway. Right. Right. So who cares what we're using it from, right? It's probably fine. Yeah. No, it's interesting. The world's really changed. Hey, here's a good one. Uh, somebody in, um, has just, this is from our Discord. Somebody just issued a pull request to add okay. Bing Chat to Power Toys. Uh, <laughs> sure. So that you can actually run Bing Chat in the taskbar. There you go. Nice, That's nice. Yeah, I need yep. a command line chat. Yeah. Hey, there are multiple examples of things that debuted in Power Toys that did end up showing up in some way in Windows. Oh, right? like some of the snap and, and uh, Richard, tools we got in Windows 11. You'll mm -hmm. be thrilled to know that ChatGPT has a very inexpensive API, and it's very easy to run ChatGPT on the command line. I do it all the time. <clears throat> there you go. The API is tri tri uh, trivial because it's you could use curl. It's just sending. You know, <laughs> just do you even hear what you say? <laughs> The API is trivial you because you curl. can use curl. Yes. <laughs> so you just, you send a post and, uh, you know, request and it, and it sends back the content as a JSON file, you know, and you, it's <laughs> okay. fairly easy to parse. Yeah, we that. all know how to parse those. Well, that's, those that's, I mean, who doesn't, that's right? Our no, there's plenty of libraries. I don't know how to parse them, but yeah. there's fortunately many libraries out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, chat GPT <laughs> on command line is that's done. And because they made the API so inexpensive, I can't remember what it is, yes. like two cents per, you know, a hundred thousand requests or something. It's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, it, that's way, one way to kick off a kind of Cambrian explosion. No kidding. Right? No like, kidding. On. Make a very, make no, a simple API but, uh, you know, and an maybe, inexpensive <clears throat> interaction. You're going to have apps, you know, Three months from now, there'll be apps all over the place using uh, ChatGPT. All over you the know, place. We were, we were talking earlier about some group, small group, a guy, you know, whatever, coming up and, you know, disrupting the whole world. Maybe that company's already, maybe that company is OpenAI and it's already happened, right? Like yeah. maybe, they got maybe those guys are already. billion from Microsoft on something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, interesting. Talk to you, talk to me about Starfield. Yeah. Delta. Oh, I'm excited about this. I want to know if I should get it. All right, so Starfield is a long-awaited game from Bethesda, which has since been bought by Microsoft as part of, well, part of Bethesda. Um, mm -hmm. the, the reason this is kind of, well, it's supposed to be, it, it, it looks amazing. It's, you know, highly uh, anticipated. But this is the thing that's come up in the argument with Sony, right? That uh, Starfield is an example, I think, is right? Isn't this one of the games where they're like, actually, we're going to make this an, X -field, an Xbox exclusive? Mm -hmm. Is that not true? Windows and Xbox. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Xbox Platinum. See, I told you they were going to do that. That, that, that was Sony's point. So this is the poster child for C. They're C? just going to do the same thing that we do. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't mean that we do. I mean, they're going to do this thing that is terrible. I know. I mean, we wouldn't do that. But, <clears throat> yeah. This is, I mean, uh, the first time I heard about this was right after Skyrim shipped. Okay. Like, wow. how are you going to top Skyrim? And they said, we're going to do Skyrim in space. I yeah, love Skyrim. That, that was literally a great game. It's more it than a decade. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I it's took not a, coming out next a, week. So I took a laser to the knee, <clears throat> right? Wow. Yeah. This I, is, uh, so they've announced the. Oh, let's watch it. Let's the just, release date is for November watch it. 11. Let's just have a little visit to Starfield. Yeah. Um, it looks, it does look great. So, so you're saying Skyrim in space? That's pretty. Cleanup is essentially the idea. I mean, Skyrim yeah. was your ultimate open world right. game. Right. You wanted to do this thing. Oh. In space. oh man, this looks like Metroid Prime. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, nice. okay. We're uh, we're in there. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. There's a there's a crater. There's a, a sun and another moon, and I don't know what's going on. This it's is just crater your where typical Cortana landed. Your typical <clears throat> trailer that does nothing and tells you nothing. Um, yeah. All right. But the idea is we'd be able to wander around an open universe yeah. that's in space. It just knows there's a ton of open world space games, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Elite and yeah. Eve. Oh, and like, right. There's so many. Right. My biggest concern is anything that's been worked on for this long has baggage. Right. right? Like there's sort of a there's sort of a curve for developing anything <clears throat> where it's not going to be good if it's done in a year. 
it, it maybe it peaks to two, two oh, and a half years. That's an interesting year. point. Yeah. But at yeah. four years, you're going downhill. So this is like uh, Duke Nukem forever, forever baby. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, um, the real question is how many times it's been restarted, and it sounds yep. like how many different rendering engines did they switch to? How many? Yeah, you know, and it, and I, and I understand engines. that when Microsoft got the got the company and they sort of went through the catalog, right. they basically gave them room to say start Starfield's over. So. There's some possibility that it's a current, very current rendering engine, very current. I mean, it works great for Windows Vista. So I think, um, <laughs> no, I don't know. know. I'm sure it's fine. But they are awfully late to the open world space game. Yep, yep. Except that it's Bethesda. Like, Fallout was a, Skyrim was a profound game. Fallout was a profound yep. game. Like, just a really interesting world that they yep. then mm -hmm. did terrible things in what was know? that game uh, no man's sky that kind of crazy was that yeah. a sony title yeah it wasn't it wasn't bethesda they were an indie uh, yeah. they were an indie that maybe it sony distributed yeah because that, that had the promise of this game and uh yeah and I mean, if they, there they, are still people using it they'll tell you it's now they finally got it to where it, it took be, a long right? time yeah yeah it took a long time. time. As will Cyberpunk and, yeah. 2077 all <laughs> the article <laughs> saying it'll never be good, so give up. Sure. <laughs> well, and, and and what's what's the one that Chris Roberts has been getting more and more money for never delivering on? It's just <laughs> astonishing. That's a good deal. I like that deal. Or something or other. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's the, you know, talk about a space game that never ships. Yep. Yeah. Mm. All right. The let's problem is it became as big as space. We still have much, much to do. Star Citizen. Star oh, Citizen. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. Yeah. yeah. Star Citizen, the game that'll never show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, raised, he's raised hundreds of millions, mostly from the people who want to play the game. By God, selling them assets in the game, that's kind of a scam. It still isn't finished. That sounds like a scam. I'm sure yeah, he, he has every what, intention of what delivering. Are yeah. Interesting. Was this balance of yeah. power. Is that Chris? Uh, what was that game? Um, Crawford. Chris Crawford. Chris Crawford. Oh, I'm sorry. Legendary. Yeah, yeah. No, Legendary. Chris Roberts was the, uh, yeah. They, he had a whole line of space games where he got like Mark Hamill to voice pieces of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's not. Mark Hamill was it. No, he was it. Well, I, okay. No, he, actually, Mark Hamill's a good voiceover guy. He yeah. Does the Joker in the Batman series. Um, hey, you know what? Mark Hamill's was easy. Wing Commander was uh, Mark Wing Hamill. Commander was Oh, Chris actually, Roberts. I liked Wing Commander. God, that yeah, goes yeah. back a ways. This is the classics. Right? Yeah. Oh, I liked Wing Commander. Okay. Oh, he was at Origin. All right. Okay. Okay. This is That goes back to the very early 90s, I bet. Yeah, 1990. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say possibly the 80s, yeah. But, you and know, then, it's one of those things where you, pro you promise impossible things, and then right. you keep trying to make them, and... It's just stunning amounts of money. Yeah, and I'm I mean, sure he's work working hard on it. So it's just hard. Yeah, to, I hope so. Yeah, no, I, I don't really think do. it's a scam. I think he's he's just you know it's well, he's one he's guy. Right? So large that he might be one of those people who can't accept anything that isn't perfect. Okay, get yeah. this: as of February 22nd, they've raised 474 million oh, in crowdfunding. Holy Yikes! They could make a Call of Duty game with that. Half a billion in crowdfunding, and then another 63 million in external investments. Oh, okay. They still have delivered. They've that, delivered pieces. Like yeah. it's, it's astonishing. It truly is. Well, they have announced they're allocating more resources <laughs> towards this development. <laughs> okay. What were they doing with that money before? You know. uh, Chris Roberts stated that if at least twenty three million could be raised over the course of a crowdfunding campaign, no outside investors or developers funding would be required. This goal was reached in October eighteenth, twenty thirteen. Yeah. Ten years ago. Wow. Yeah. Ten years they, ago. And, the, and Star Citizen and Elite uh, did their crowdfunding about the same time. And Elite's <laughs> been in the market now right. for 10 years. Right, you know? right. Actually, That's there was crazy. just a new kind of Elite. I saw, where did I see that? I think it's on Linux. <laughs> not, not Elite Dangerous, but a new well, kind of text-based Elite, going back to the original. Uh, anyway, that's enough of this gaming. We've done it now. Have we done yeah, it? Yeah, well, we've done it. I played it on the Apple II back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, all right. We uh, let's take a little break. We have the back of the book. We have a brown liquor and many tips. But first, a word from our sponsor, the good folks at CDW. This episode of Windows Weekly brought to you by Lenovo orchestrated by the experts at CDW. The helpful people at CDW understand as the world changes, your organization needs to adapt quickly to be successful. So 
How can CDW keep your business ahead of the curve with, I got one right here, Lenovo ThinkPads. These powerful devices deliver the business class performance you're looking for thanks to Windows 10 and the Intel Evo platform. With your remote teams working across the country and around the world, collaboration is not a problem because Lenovo ThinkPads keep your organization productive and connected from anywhere. Plus, CDW knows your workforce has different work styles and needs flexibility, which is why Lenovo ThinkPads are equipped with responsive tools and built-in features that let your team work seamlessly across their favorite tools. Think about that for a second. Let's not forget about security. These high-performance machines protect at the highest level with built-in hardware to guard against modern threats without slowing your team down. When you need to get more out of your technology, Lenovo makes seamless productivity possible. CDW makes it powerful. Learn more at cdw.com slash Lenovo client. Now we get to the back of the book, my favorite part of the show. <clears throat> and uh, let's kick things off with Paul and a tip of the week. I just brought up a a page that had prices on it, and they were all huge numbers. I'm like, oh, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, always like, have well, to divide just, by 20, right? How is, by 20. How is, yes. Yeah, it's not quite as good as 20 right now, but yes, 20. So yeah. A peso you know, is roughly um, a nickel. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so I, <laughs> I was like, how is this like, utility? Oh, $114. It's $20,000. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, over, I think it was over the weekend, I saw Zach Bowden over at uh, Windows Central tweeted that he wiped out a PC without checking what was on it. And then as it was wiping, realized it was a super important file oh, on there God. that he's never going to get back, right? We've all done this. The thing is, when it comes to backup religion or what I'll call, now call backup or sync religion, most people have to lose something important for them to get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So my Steve tip Gibson, here is to... Steve Gibson wiped a hard drive with 50 Bitcoin on it. Yeah. How about them, I mean, Apple? This is, yep. This is, this is what, you know, this is what happens. That's a lot yeah, of money. It, it, people who know better, and I, my, I've done this too. I mean, we, everyone succumbs to this. But um, I, I, I just, the funny thing is, back in early December, Microsoft quietly updated OneDrive on Windows 11 without telling anyone it was coming. Uh, one of two big updates to Windows 11, they never tested or did anything for the other one being that start pill thing we were complaining about for a few months there. Um, and what they did was they added more folders to the backup function, right? So uh, for a long, long time, you could back up, I think it was desktop documents and probably pictures to OneDrive automatically. And the idea there is if you did that all on all of your PCs, you'd have the same files in each location on each PC and obviously up in the cloud. Um, I think this is a great way to do things. But with that update in December, they added the other two folders that are under your use account. So uh, music and videos. So if you want like everything to be synced to the cloud, which makes sense if you have a uh, Microsoft 365 subscription, right, with a terabyte of storage, um, it's a great way to ensure that you never lose anything, right? I, I use the desktop as a scratch space. Um, if I come up here and you know, the hard drive failed or whatever, um, I could lose that kind of stuff. So uh, I guess the tip is don't be a statistic and um, you don't have to use OneDrive. I mean, OneDrive is is what I use. It's I do recommend it. There are, there are features to OneDrive that I think kind of put it over the top, including a uh, cloud-based recycle bin and the ability to get file versions of files, which I think is important. But whatever, um, you can use, like if you want to use a NAS, although I think there's a geographical kind of aspect to the cloud backup that's very important too. But um, I actually, never put yourself... I, I, I concur. I've been allowing both Mac OS and Windows to do what they do by default, which yeah. is to back up to the yeah. cloud. I know they mm -hmm. do that because nobody backs up, and so they don't, you know, they right. want to protect That's it. Right. And you know what? It's fine. I wouldn't say just make it that the fine. only one. Uh, it's probably it depends on what it is. Yeah, I'm right, for sure. Uh, for sure. I mean, I have, um, my photos are in multiple locations. Like yeah, that exactly. stuff's important to me. And, as it should be. Yeah. I'm, I'm in transition, of course, because I've brought my own infrastructure at home for forever. Right. And my old, my old file server needs to be retired. Um, I have most stuff in one drive, but we're now moving as an M365 mm -hmm. world. But I'm also right. abundantly aware that should you run afoul of any of Microsoft's exactly. rules that close your account, exactly. that block your account down, like yep. if you get marked as, say, possibly a, a traitor in child porn, yeah. I'm presuming you're not, yeah. the yeah. account will simply be locked. And there's, right. there is no, the, the recourse will take years. The right. data is not lost. It is no longer accessible to you. Yeah. 
So, and that's, you know, that, that's happened with Google as well. Like, there are stories yeah. of people. Oh, we had a caller on Ask the to. Tech Guys two weeks ago. Yeah. Uploaded that's pictures of his from his childhood. Who is is scanning right. videos in from old tapes, and it had yep. the two he his sister you know frolicking in a kiddie pool, yep. and Google sure. decided yep. it was child porn, and he's lost access to everything, including everything. business stuff. So while there, it's a convenience, but but Richard, right. this is the standard for backup in business too. You don't have one copy. Sure. That's right. You yeah. have near term, you know, online backup, which I would consider this online backup. Yeah. And then you I have mean, you, offline backup, which is more If your pictures are permanent. important to you, you should be backing up directly from your phone to at least two different things. I do Amazon services. and Google. Yeah. Um, so it, my, my only debate was, do we use the Synology as the as the mm -hmm. local file server for the right. house? Here's or what I do. We, Here's what I do. Or use M365 and sync it to the Synology yeah. as a backup. So I kind of oh, do something I would do like that. that. I would actually, I would do that. I have <laughs> OneDrive on my Windows machines. The problem is I'm very cross-platform. So uh, right, having yeah. having iCloud on my Mac and OneDrive on my PC doesn't solve the problem. But I use SyncThing, which is a free open source program that will sync hard drives. So that way I have a standard documents folder several other folders, music and stuff, on all of my machines. And then I use the Synology, has a sync thing client on it, which then syncs to the Synology. So that's the kind of the more permanent storage. And then I go one step further. I have a, I have dual Synologies. I have one here and one at home. And my offsite is hyper backup on the Synology backing up here. So I right. have many. Hmm. I mean, if I lost data, it would have to be because there was a nuclear strike on Petaluma. <laughs> Yeah. At this point, only, sure. and, and even then, you probably still have it. In I still have the cloud, cloud. <laughs> right. Yeah. right? So right. even that, I mean, you'd have to access it from the space station you'd be going to. Yeah. But the biggest, yeah. and you I need, should point this need. out: the biggest risk to all of the, that's a good setup, right? That's as good as you're mm -hmm. going to get is human error. Yep. Me, yeah. me, sinking an empty folder to all of those or something <laughs> like that, right? Sure. Or, or you know, getting yourself encrypted with ransomware and then sinking the ransomware and then sinking the, yes. Folder. So it's very Which, easy. By the way, one, OneDrive has ransomware protection. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I figure I'm yeah. kind of, but, you know, and 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 having that hyper backup, uh, I think, is giving me that offsite, which is important also. So I've got yeah. kind of two offsites. The concept of an air-gapped network, right? Like you have a right. piece that's not attached. That's exactly. I actually exactly. use my, uh, because we I rotate through phones not quite as fast as I, well, in some ways as fast as I do with PCs, but... When I decommission a phone or reset a phone, I'll download the photos from it to the PC and copy it to my NAS. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as kind of a bulk. This is another place to have it. You know, it's yeah, not it's not day to day. Copies. It's just yeah, yeah but just multiple make sure copies. You have multiple copies. Yeah. Here's a yeah. question though. I wonder. So I turn on versioning as well. Sync thing will allow you to do mm -hmm. fairly sophisticated Version, versioning. Versioning is really important because, like, that's the oh, that's the empty folder thing you were talking about. Yeah. You could do that on a file basis where you blow something away in a Word doc or whatever. Close it. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> but I have the one you I know. did last time and the time before. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So versioning is huge. Sync thing, which is I couldn't recommend more highly, has a variety of different kinds of uh, versioning systems you can use. Right. But I wonder, and I don't know who to ask on this one. I imagine there's ransomware sophisticated enough to right. uh, propagate into your versions as well. I don't know. <laughs> She's probably. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's an I interesting question. I, Word docs probably have a versioning fil feature built in that's in there whenever whatever they have open XML format or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, you could definitely. I'm sure ransomware would have no problem getting into that. It's just an open file. Yeah, because it's just a folder. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah, actually, it's pretty much. I think it's a zip file, basically. Right. Is what it is. Right. But, I'll have yeah. to look at that. Anyway. But yeah, I mean, th this is. I mean, it's certainly possible nowadays to. Don't ever have robust. important data in one don't place. Don't trust a cloud. <laughs> Yeah, don't ever. trust yeah. a company, yeah. In, I guess. Don't trust no. one thing ever, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, all and right, half pick of the week. Yeah, this is kind of an old chestnut in a way, but it's was running Windows 11 is still important. So one of the things that happened with Moment 2, which was released last week, is they updated the taskbar and broke a bunch of, of, of utilities that integrate with the shell in Windows. So... Um, Start 11 updated their app to work with Moment 2. And remember that for now, uh, the people running this thing are mostly enthusiasts. They know to go to Windows Update. They know to look for updates. They know to say yes to a preview version of an update to get Moment 2. No, the real release date of Moment 2 is the, what is it, two, next Tuesday, the 14th, which is the second Tuesday of March. So most people won't be getting it until next week. 
in which case uh, start 11, it, which is the start menu replacement that start out makes, will be completely compatible with the moment too. So when people get it, they'll be all set. So if you, um, if you already have start 11, update it and everything will be fine. And uh, I want, I was going to look up the price. I, I want to say <laughs> the price I got was hilarious. Let me just actually, is it still on my screen? It's like $6 um, or something. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's I, some it might be as much as 11. Yeah. Uh, in Mexico, it's 115 pesos. Um, so I guess whatever divided by 20. Um, so, <laughs> so you might be right. It's a six nickel. Points. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I have, I don't know why this math is still so hard for me uh, or why every time I get a receipt, I'm like, Dai! you're oh, living oh. in Mexico now. dude. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. It's hard. It's I, I'll get. So it, I've, it's what not like I do, when you go to Europe and it's like 1.2, you know, or whatever. No, like it's, it's easy. What I do is I cut yeah. off the last digit and oh, then no, divide it in half. And that's the number. I know. I know. It's so easy. It's just, it's, I know. It's just, <laughs> a big number. It's, you, you see the big number and you get, you're like, you. So I see 111, I go 11, I that's five tacos. bucks How and 50 it cents. It's yeah. two tacos, man. Yeah, then you do the math and you're like, oh. Oh, oh no, I've been I watching your Instagram and looking at your menus and then looking at the prices. Oh, and I get to, listen, I'm going, okay. oh my God, that was 70 you, got, pesos. Oh my God. I got to tell you, yeah, oh, so you saw that. So I saw it. those lunches we have, those are $3.50 a piece. $3.50. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. This is, I'm talking like a three course meal. I mean, it's like that uh, chicken soup thing we had, $3. Yeah. Incredible. Like, it's incredible. It is amazing. It's, and, 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 it's, and it's delicious. Yeah. That's the oh other my God, thing. It's a, and it's, incredibly it's too much good. food. Yeah. We walk out of there. We don't, you don't want to like leave food on a plate in Mexico, you know? But you walk out of there, you're like, my God, I ate too much. Like, it's yeah. crazy. Like, yeah. how, yeah, it's uh -huh. unbelievable. Uh -huh. I, I, want I so you. want to retire, <laughs> it's like, but I want yeah. to retire where the beach. So I'm I'm looking at the yeah. coasts, you know. Sure, sure. Well, but you I'll come visit same. you in the city. Don't worry. You get the same. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful here. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, Leo and Lisa are here again. Oh my God. <laughs> Just uh, don't answer the door. Pretend oh, we're not here. Pretend we're not here. They Turn see the your lights. Instagram. <laughs> they see your Instagram. I see your Instagram, Paul. I know you're in there. <laughs> What's going on munching. on Run As Radio? You're in New Zealand, but you still get shows. Uh, this is a show actually I shot back in uh, February at NDC uh, with a fellow by the name of Kyle uh, uh, Kotowick. Um, we were talking mostly about passwordless, but it ended up being oh. a long conversation about Fido 2. Oh, cool. Uh, Must listen. whatever I think. Yeah, I, I always think about like these UB keys, right? I'm yeah, big on, yeah. on using UB keys to yep. do further authentication and so forth. But Kyle dug into this fact that you don't have to have a UB key. Like a combination of a fingerprint reader your with phone. a TPM chip your machine, yeah, yeah. Or, or your phone will generate a token. So you can yeah. you effectively um, are able to do that I cross think authentication. That's, that's why we're seeing passwordless now finally is almost everybody has a biometric authentication device yeah. in their pockets. And uh, that's so, a great solution. Oh, yeah. I gotta listen and, to this. And, yeah, the and it's another reason. Like, I'm really glad to be hanging up my old AD infrastructure because I never upgraded it enough to make Windows Hello work properly. But now that I'm switching over to M365 with Azure AD for everything, and Windows Hello works fine. And Windows Hello does lots of options. Hello is so good. Uh, yeah, that is good. something uh, you, Microsoft does much better than Apple. I really think Hello is amazing. The, that updated Microsoft Authenticator directly addressed the biggest problem with Authenticators, is, which is people just saying yes to stuff. Right. Right. The, the new way that Authenticator works, where the app shows you a number and then the yeah, Authenticator isn't that good? shows yeah. three numbers. Yeah. Because yeah. I've been on the, I've been talking to a friend of mine who's an IT guy who's working with one of his users whose account is under attack, like under <laughs> attack at the time. Wow. And then the user saw an Authentication request came in and just said yes. Yep. Oh, right, and then permitted the attacker in. Where with the number trick, that would be impossible because right. you don't know the number. So Brilliant. yeah, it's a great step forward. And the conversation with Kyle was real powerful, just to say. But we really got to a place by the end of that show where it's like, hey, you can do multi-factor authentication that the user doesn't even really realize they're even doing anymore. It's mm. Like they do these couple, they they're doing these couple of steps. It feel like authentication, and then things just work. So he's what he works at NBC. Uh, no, no, this was a conference that we were, oh, we were at. Oh, NDC. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you were NDC. at the NDC concert con con conference. Yeah, we were yeah. at the conference. But no, he's an independent uh, uh, consultor, consultant in Canada. Oh, this is a must listen. He's an interesting project. Yeah, hmm. yeah, this is good. I have to listen to it. Runasradio.com. Show 870.
870. I will absolutely be listening to us walking around the park near my place there. Like this is, I oh. just, I, I almost this morning, that was almost the thing I listened to, but it will be yeah. the next thing. Yeah. Is that, it seems like a must listen. Yeah. Yeah, actual you, content as opposed to what we do here at twit which is this kind of chat gpt <laughs> style more of a scrum <laughs> <laughs> than a conversation but brown lick time my friends <laughs> the moment you've all been waiting for yes and, then, and my ongoing saga going through the process of how a scottish whiskey is actually made so we uh we we've talked about the barley we've talked about the malting process uh, where we talked about, you know, we dry with peat. That's where that peaty flavor comes from. And so now you've got this malted barley. So it's it's sprouted and you've dried it. It's it's actually like like heavily dried toast, like it's crumbly dry. Mm. So the next step is to mill it, right, um, to actually to to break it down. And this, you know, I sort of casually mental, mentioned malt and folks always ask, well, single malts like what does that even mean right and it, and in theory you a single malt used to mean it came from a particular malting oh so they when a distillery grew its own grain and uh malted it itself if the if the bottles came from it uh, came from that malting that was single malt it doesn't mean that anymore simply because whiskey has grown at too large created at too large a scale at factory scale you can't really count on a given malting the barley comes from multiple places. It's malted in larger lots. It's dried and, and ground in different lots. So uh, these days, single malt really means came from a particular distillery. Yeah. So, you know, a, a, a Balvini, say, you know, 12-year-old single malt is, it doesn't only even have just 12-year-old in it. 12 means it's the youngest thing in the bottle. There right. might be older in it to get to a consistent flavor profile, right? This need, this need for folks to say, hey, if I buy a bottle of Balvini 12, it tastes like Balvini 12, the same as the last one, means that there's very clever folks who work hard to get those flavor profiles consistent. And this is literally humans tasting it, right? That There tasting are tasters it. who... Remarkable tasters. Like, yeah. they taste things. I uh, I have sat with one of them. He says, taste these three. And I'm like, these all taste the same. He's, He's like, like, well, no, they don't. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, super tasters. Amazing. As right? opposed to the... And, and then there's the blends. And, the, and blends typically come from multiple distilleries. And I tell this story to talk about the whiskey that I picked out this week, and it's related to the milling story as well, which is the Craigalachi 13, the Armagnac edition. Hmm. The Craigalachi um, 13 yeah. aged in Armagnac barrels. Finished in Ar Armagnac. Finished. Armagnac. That's his last year in Armagnac. Now, the name, and it's not a well known brand. In fact, most. It's because Craigalachi, you can't say it. That's why. <laughs> it's the, it's the and, Scottish and really the, Craigslist. And the, <laughs> and, the, and the Scots say it, Craigalaki. Craigalaki. Yeah. It's great. Uh, Craigalaki. Uh, right. Now, uh, it's not my favorite distillery, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, most of their, pro, their, their barrels end up in Dewar's. And I do like a Dewar's 12, which is a blended whiskey. Hmm. And Dewar's and Sons own Craigalachi along with Ben Renison and oh, other brothers. That's interesting. But the Craigalachi is not just a distillery, it's also a town, and it's also got a phenomenal hotel in it called the Craigalachi. Ooh, let's go. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> and it's it is my launching pad whenever I'm in in Space Side to do yeah. some shopping. I I stay there. Um it's more than 120 years old. It used to be the old train station, but the train lines are gone now. Uh, it is a sportsman's hotel, which is to say uh, it has a sportsman's entrance, a place where you can clean your a mud kilt. room. Yeah, <laughs> clean your yeah. kilt. Uh, clean your kilt. Well, so if you yes. if you've shot an elk <laughs> or if you have caught some salmon from the Spey River, the, well, there's an entrance for you to go into to prep them up and then to have easy access to the freezer so you can freeze your catch. Uh, there are lovely restaurant downstairs called the Copper Dog. Uh, hmm. And they make their own blends there as well. And I've eaten there many times. The The thing about the Craigalaki is the quiche, which is the exactly what you think of when you think of a, of a whiskey bar. Right. Wooden floor, wall, ceiling, yeah. windows on the Spey River, large fireplace at the one end. The bar goes off to the horizon in either direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big over stuffed chairs. But do you uh, have to the, kill your own meal ahead of time or is that not... Yeah. Part of the deal. The, it's, the, rec it's recommended. Yeah, the, the, the Where's your salmon, Lottie? You're not eating here, here until you, 
you have the. Is oh, this, they make they make a mean Scottish breakfast, man. It's the it's best. It's Scotland's uh, oldest whiskey hotel. Yeah. The fact that they uh, brand themselves a whiskey hotel. <gasps> Look oh, yeah. how beautiful that is. Oh. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. It looks like an estate. That, that was like on the one sunny day. Uh, yeah. It is okay. Tough. Be prepared. <laughs> yeah, it's a little damp. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh. uh, but yeah, and so and there are whiskeys there. I mean, many of the unusual whiskeys that I've ever gone and hunted down, I was able to taste at the glacier. You so can't drink uh, here unless you can pronounce it, laddie. Yeah, <laughs> the Krigalaki. But we were talking about milling. Oh, and that leads back me to, to milling. Yes, uh, milling. So this is when we take the dried malt and yes. now we want to grind it into grist to break it down into various components. Um, most distilleries actually have their own milling machines, although they can, all, they can from the major producers, order pre-ground grist in their preferred ratios. They, you know that story of how every machine today is made to be obsolete? Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the opposite story. Let's talk about, <laughs> yep. let's talk about the company Porteous and the company um, uh, Robert Bobby. They both made these mills. <laughs> Robert and, Bobby? And <laughs> Robert Bobby Mills. Robert Bobby this Bob. Is in the, in, <laughs> this is in the late 1800s. So this is Victorian era. And these machines are essentially indestructible. They're still running today. And both companies are out of business because there's only so many distilleries and only so many breweries that need these mills. And these mills never fail. Oh, wow. They need maintenance. But other than that, and so Well, it's today, just a big when you rock, need, right? I mean, how hard could it be? <laughs> two sets of rollers. So they have a screening okay. system that takes out the debris. Then they have a, crack, a a cracker roller, which cracks the grain. And then you have a grinder roller that grinds it down into, into fines. So you really want sort of hull, grist, or, or the medium, and then flour, which is the fine grind. Uh, and you wanted them in different ratios. The, the typical is about 20% hull, 70% heart, 10% flour. Some ratios are like 15-85, like it, it depends. The problem here is that when we go to the next step, which is mashing, we're going to attempt to use hot water to start extracting the sugars from the malt. And if you ground it all to flour, it's actually quite water resistant. Like it's hard to get the water into the flour. So they don't want too much flour. They want more grist. But if you don't grind it coarsely enough, you can't get the sugars out. So this is all about optimizing sugar extraction. And so these mills do, uh, do a very precise grinding so you can actually uh, pull it out. And um, the Kregelaki distillery, while it doesn't have a regular tour, I have had a chance to take a peek in there. And they have one of these porteous mills. They're like a five ton machine. The, uh, you know, half the height of the building, bright red, uh, and uh, and a hundred years old. <laughs> the oldest, the oldest Porteous that they found that are still running are one hundred and fifty years old. Wow! So that that's the process. Now you've ground it down into grist. Next step will be get it to get to the mash done, and we can do that next week. In the meantime, the Kregelaki thirteen Bas Armagnac is uh, aged in. Um, in bourbon barrels and then transferred to Armagnac barrels for its last year. So it comes across a bit sweeter and stronger. It's relatively difficult to find, although that particular bottling, the 13 about uh, Armagnac, it's about $60 if you can find one. Uh, it's uh, it's hmm. an interesting interpretation. Armagnac is Armagnac barrels, the Armagnac producers tend to hold onto their barrels, so they're fairly hard to come by. So there's not very many uh, Scottish whiskeys made with Armagnac, uh, uh, with those Armagnac flavors, which are distinct. Uh, Armagnac is a very old liquor. One would argue one of the very first liquors ever made was distillate of grape into brandy. And the Armagnac process is sort of the original kind of primitive process, as opposed to cognac, which is a two-stave higher distillation and different aging process. The Kregelaki, they call it muscular. <laughs> it's, it's a muscular whiskey. Sure. It's not. It's Got not an punch. effeminate whiskey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just a word of it's, warning. It's brown yeah. water is what it is. Yes, it, it, they finish it in the Bas Armagnac barrels to round out the muscular Kregelaki. There you go. So there you go. First matured in ex bourbon and ex sherry <laughs> casks, then rested in Bas Armagnac casks for just over a year for a steadfast dram. Yeah, I like it. Oh. 
It's got a yeah. it's got a punch to it. Uh, is that what muscular means? Know. Okay, it's got a punch yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. you'll know you were drinking something. <laughs> oh, well, what did I say the first time I had? Um, uh, uh, what was that? Jeez, I'm losing my mind. I feel like first I've time been I had kicked by a, by a horse. <laughs> I said, I, no, I, I said, I feel like I've been shot in the tongue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Wow. How fun. Uh, so, Bill, I have some great that. tales of mash tons to tell the next time around. Well, and then I want to hear about these worm tubs because they keep talking about their worm that's tubs. A, that's a thing. That's, that's a, thing. a That's a, one of the older processes. You know, many, <laughs> many distilleries have modernized pieces of that. Sometimes you have Victorian gear. The, mo the contemporary gear is mostly German. It's derived from brewery. Like everything we've done so oh, far to the barley, is, is we're on the beer. same path that yeah. we're making yeah, beer. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. And we are, going to end, we are going to get to a point of wart. And then we're going to change path. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Nice. This is good. Yeah. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. Thank you for doing this, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm having a great time. Yeah. We're really learning here. Richard Campbell, runasradio.com. And .NET rocks, you find that there as well. And uh, much appreciated, a new contributor to the show on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Of course, Paul Therati's at therat.com. Become a premium member. That's when you get the, the really good stuff. Uh, I am, for sure. And, of course, his book, The Field Guide to Windows 11, is available now with The Field Guide to Windows 10 bundled in. Right inside there. Yeah. Increasingly irrelevant because it's getting there. You yeah. Know? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. The book's getting up there. Uh, it's going to be around a long time, friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you saw that 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 graph. Um, yeah. And, of course, he's writing a new book, uh, which we will tell you about when it comes out. But leanpub.com mm -hmm. is where you go to get those. We, uh, we do Windows Weekly right here every uh, Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, used to be 1900, but you know what? Uh, we are setting our clocks back to summertime on Sunday. So By that the way, yes, we are not in Mexico. So now the time change is going to go from one hour to two. <laughs> I know. Does Mexico not set the clocks? They did before. This is the first year they're not doing it. I'm moving. Yep. People are starting to drop out. I'm it's moving. Daylight savings finally yeah. starting to die, and it needs to die. It's, so it's die. safer. The food's better. <sighs> the food's less expensive. And... They don't set their clock back? <laughs> yes, that's the, the icing on this You live cake. in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> no. You Nothing's live in perfect, heaven. Uh, I'll tell the, uh, I'll tell the uh, sweet potato guy you said so. Yes, guy please. His, tooting his horn. As so he it will street. be 1800 UTC next week. Uh, all of our okay. shows. We It's not because UTC changes. We change. So because right. uh, we are... Yeah, because you do where you are changes time. Yeah, yeah, we're springing forward. So we actually change our time in, in real right. world terms, but uh, we're springing forward in a, on Sunday, and that means we'll be at a, whatever I said, 1800 UTC starting next Wednesday. You can watch us live. I mean, honestly, you don't need to know what time we recorded unless you want to watch us live. That uh, stream, audio or video, is live.twit.tv. If you're watching live, please chat with us live. We have an IRC open to all, irc.twit.tv. But, of course, uh, my preference is you'd be in a club, the Club Twit, and get to chat in the uh, exclusive Club Twit Discord where we only serve 13-year-old Ba Armagnac <laughs> cask liquors that's right uh, uh actually the club <laughs> is less a club <laughs> club is less expensive than a single shot of that by the way seven bucks a month 84 bucks a year uh you can you can pay more if you want you don't have to what do you get is ad free versions of all of our shows access to the best dang discourse in the whole wide world it is uh the discord i should say it is, it is a fun place to hang with Superman, at, wow! I didn't know he was a drinker. Yeah, uh, Superman and, too. <laughs> and others, uh, he's uh, drinking. Uh, Superman, you should at least drink black label, not Johnny Walker Red. Come on, <laughs> I mean, get with it. You're the man of steel. It's matching the cape. Uh, as you can see, our Discord is full of animated gifts, but that's not all. We also have discussions about plenty of other topics, not. Uh, just the shows. We've got books. In fact, we have a Stacy's Book Club coming up in April. We have uh, coding. I, I hang out in the coding section. Travel, anime, comics, and on and on and on. It's a great huh. community uh, of like-minded people. And you get the Twit Plus feed, which has shows we don't put out anywhere else, including this guy's Windows Hands on Windows show. Yep. Um, Tomorrow's episode, I think, is Moment Two. Yes. 
We're gonna make that one. We're gonna make public on the YouTube feed. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know what Hands On Windows is like, you can watch that Moments Two episode. But all the rest are behind the paywall at uh, Club Twit. It's a small paywall, seven bucks. It's only about that high. It's a really tiny little paywall, but it's important to us because it keeps us on the air, frankly, uh, in uh, tough times. So, uh, and we are in tough times. We're actually, advertising is down lower than it was during all of COVID, which is wow. uh, somewhat concerning. So, uh, it actually, Lisa's at the podcast movement uh, right now uh, with uh, our sales team trying to drum up some business. But we shouldn't, you know what? I don't think we should be dependent on that. Uh, I'd much rather be dependent on you, our dear listeners. So if you can see your way to seven bucks a month, see your way to twit.tv slash club twit. I promise it will be worth it. And it does make a big difference uh, to us. After the fact, we do have, of course, ad supported versions of everything we, uh, well, I used to say everything we do, not everything we do, but all the things we used to do at uh, the website, twit.tv, including Windows Weekly, twit.tv slash WW. Uh, we also uh, have YouTube channel dedicated to Windows Weekly. That's got even more ads in it. And uh, I don't know. Does, I don't even know. Does YouTube stick ads into, I guess it would if you're not a premium, yeah, YouTube premium think person. Probably. Yeah. yeah. So even more ads if you want them uh, on YouTube. Uh, but the best thing to do, of course, is subscribe in your favorite podcast client. That way you'll get it automatically. You could choose audio or video or both. And uh, it'll download to your device or your laptop or whatever, and you'll be able to listen at your leisure, uh, which I encourage you to do because those regular downloads help us kind of keep track of, you know, what you're interested in. Uh, that's about it for this edition of Windows Weekly. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Richard. Have a great time. Richard, are you going to be in New Zealand again next week or are you coming home? I will not. I will be in Wales. <laughs> will you be joining oh, us in, from Wales? Absolutely. Fantastic. A long trip. Are you going direct to there? I got two days at home in between. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of travel. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, well, have a safe trip, and uh, we'll talk to you in Wales and you in Mexico City and you mm -hmm. wherever you are anywhere in the world. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. <laughs> if you love all things Android, well, I've got a show for you to check out. It's called All About Android, and I'll give you three guesses what we talk about. We talk about Android, the latest news, hardware, apps. We answer feedback. It's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Wintwit Dow, and a whole cast of awesome characters talking about the operating system that we love. You can find All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA.